afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, for this fifth International Congress on Neurobiology and Psychopharmacology, and also for treatment guidance. It's the eighth year we are organizing this, and each time we hope we'll, we are getting better and better, and uh, the Congress is improved, and also uh, the impression of the participants uh, is uh, each year better. So uh, I will I will do the kickoff for uh, the works of the Congress with uh, the first symposium, uh, which is chaired by Professor Iliadu and uh, Kostas Pastiadis. I will give them the room to start yeah, with the, their symposium. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, it's true that over the uh, past uh, decade, this uh, uh, Congress has uh, evolved, and it uh, usually attracts uh, many uh, different clinicians and uh, researchers throughout the world. And there we will see that if a child is having hearing impairment issues, uh, then he or she, if these are left untreated or are managed uh, in a uh, fashion that it's, it's not appropriate, not early enough, uh, then uh, cognition is also impacted. And with all this, I will uh, present you with the first uh, speech of this uh, symposium from uh, Kostas Pastiadis, who is a professor of uh, musicology and en engineering. And his topic will be on uh, representations and recordings from peripheral and subcortical auditory structures, opportunities and challenges in hearing and uh, learning. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon uh, from me also. Uh, I feel very, very honored uh, to give the uh, uh, first speech of this uh, Congress, which, as uh, Professor Iliadu said, will uh, deal and focus on the combined use of uh, computational auditory models and subcortical uh, auditory structures recordings. Um, However, one may uh, think at first how such a, a topic uh, may uh, feel appropriate for, this, uh, for such a Congress. Uh, looking back at what topics neuroscience then in general terms covers, you can see that there is an enormous amount of various issues that the term neuroscience covers. From these, From the whole bunch of neuroscience topics, the uh, terms auditory neuroscience, as you see, cover uh, a very small uh, amount, which, however, is uh, having a trend of increase through years uh, since the 1990s. In a more refined level, auditory models and neuroscience also show this trend uh, since the 1990s, keeping a rather constant percent of the increase in uh, uh, scientific liter literature of the topic. From another perspective, uh, issues regarding recordings from uh, subcortical structures also show uh, through years an uh, increase in interest in the scientific research. And now, uh, one can see what auditory modeling, first of all, 
what fields, scientific fields, auditory modeling uh, may cover. One can see, of course, that neuroscience and neurology and neurobiology has the lion's share, and of course, psychology and um, speech and language pathology. Also, psychiatry covers an, uh, a good uh, amount of interest. Interestingly, however, music or other uh, kind of educational uh, research is rather low in uh, the concentration of interest. So this is uh, actually a matter of uh, uh, more interest for us to deal with this topic. Now, generally one can obtain functional uh, or biologically inspired models of auditory perception. These models are actually mathematical entities which uh, give us representations of the functionality of the auditory chain. Despite the enormous progress in the field of biology and imaging, uh, this progress in the functionality representation still remains far from being perfectly understood. And consequently, we typically uh, resort to several types of representations obtained by direct recording of electrical, magnetic, or uh, biochemical activity. In this slide, you can see uh, a functional structure of a computational model of auditory periphery together with its anatomical counterpart. Of course, we begin with the outer ear, the middle ear, uh, the cochlear uh, system, uh, with the hair cells and the uh, auditory nerve synapses, and then we go farther into the central nervous system. Starting our, uh, our review from the uh, outer ear, one can say that the uh, system of pina and tragus and all the external ear canal may be uh, very easily um, realized in computational terms um, as a head-related transfer function, as we say in mathematics and physics. This realization can be implemented in terms of uh, digital filters, together with the middle ear, which can be similarly uh, represented. Especially for the middle ear transfer function, we have actually three types of representations and models. Uh, analog electrical models, biomechanical models in terms of finite element approaches, and uh, a third approach which is very uh, easily and widely uh, implemented uh, today is the signal processing models which actually uh, represent the middle ear as a system of uh, signal processing components. Next we go into the basilar membrane of the cochlear mechanics which takes the motion of the stapes and transforms it into a motion in the oval window of the cochlea and thus sets the organ of corti in move in a transverse, transverse, transverse way. The basic characteristics of the basilar membrane is its tonotopicity, which means that specific frequencies of the sound signal are represented in specific loci across the basilar membrane. The responses of the basilar membrane actually determine important physiological properties of the auditory nerve response. Two of its most important properties are uh, the fact that are uh, first uh, nonlinear, and second uh, that shows, uh, except for nonlinearity, uh, phenomena of suppression. Um, the characteristics of basilar membrane actually are not steady. Indeed, they change with time and as the sound context, context evolve. Here we can see a triplet of some functional diagrams, proposed functional diagrams in modeling the basilar membrane functionality. We have actually uh, historically uh, a bunch of uh, models that were proposed. The first one was the gamma tone filter, the uh, next, uh, we had the gamma chirp filter. Then we had uh, the uh, model from Carney and colleagues. We had the uh, dual resonance nonlinear 
response uh, filter model. And today uh, we use the uh, multiple bandpass nonlinear model. I'm not going to get into the details and the maths uh, of these models. The important thing to notice is that uh, we have paid a lot uh, of uh, effort in modeling the basilar membrane response because it seems to be responsible for many of the psychoacoustical and psychophysical phenomena that will follow. Next, of course, we have the inner hair cells of the basilar membrane, which are responsible for the mechanoelectrical transduction in the organ of Corti. The inner hair cells transfer function, the functionality is also employed in terms of uh, digital uh, signal filters. And then we have the auditory synapses, the synapse of the inner hair cells with the auditory nerve, which is actually uh, responsible for the creation of action potentials uh, that travel a long way the, uh, the uh, auditory uh, chain towards uh, the brain. Now, the rate of release of the neurotransmitter that actually triggers these action, pot action potentials are determined basically by two factors. The first one is the inner hair cell receptor uh, membrane uh, potential, and the next one is the availability of the neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. One has to take into account that the auditory nerve activity after the uh, excitation of the hair cells, inner hair cells and outer hair cells, uh, to which I will refer later on, uh, actually is a stochastic process. Uh, modeling individual spike events in these auditory nerve fibers is much more time consuming than computing the probabilities, the statistical uh, attitude of uh, this phenomenon. By time consuming, we mean that the mathematical auditory models and their software realizations are taking too much time to be computed in order to be used, for example, in real-time applications. One should not uh, also avoid to refer to efferent effects. Until now, we were talking about afferent effects, but the efferent effects actually dealing with the uh, top-down uh, direction of information or command and control from uh, cortical or other su subcortical structures to the basilar membrane. And these effects actually can improve uh, significant parts of the performance, like the vocal discrimination uh, against background noise. So it can be seen uh, that a model of the uh, auditory periphery can actually be very complex. And this complexity uh, also shows itself uh, by emerging phenomena like the one that you can see here. For example, you can have a single tone of 2,000 hertz, and next one, uh, next you can have a, uh, another tone of 3,000 hertz uh, that sound simultaneously. However, even if they are sounding simultaneously, the response from the auditory periphery is not that linear, which means that they are not superimposed. You see here that the 2,000 hertz tone is actually suppressed by the presence of the 3,000 hertz tone. And such phenomena, like the suppression and masking, are actually adding to the... Uh, uh, vast of um, qualities that the audition, the human audition can have. Another uh, manifestation of these non-linearities that the auditory periphery, periphery uh, shows is a phenomenon called stochastic resonance. You can see here uh, another version, an optical version of the stochastic resonance phenomenon. Here you have a monument in Paris and of course, you can see that the monument is very easily discerned and made more easily comprehensible as the amount of noise is actually increased in the picture. Which means that the stochastic uh, spiking effects uh, that seem to prevail in, uh, even in case 
of silence in the responses of the auditory nerve fiber and the inner hair cells actually may improve um, the detection of specific auditory entities. Next, we move to uh, cochlear nuclei. It's the next point, the next station. Uh, there have been several um, works uh, that tried to study uh, the response of the cochlear nuclei, uh, which were actually electrophysiological. The cochlear nucleus uh, has a very rich set of uh, different types of cells, each one with its specific type of responses. So you can see chopper cells, you can see Bowser cells, you can see on cells. Each of these cells are actually uh, realize a specific type of response and attitude to the incoming signal. So the cochlear nuclei uh, may serve as a uh, preprocessor uh, as in the first stage of the uh, central nervous system. So it may serve as a preprocessor for the auditory signal for higher uh, centers. So the uh, cochlear nucleus uh, can be uh, very useful in uh, detecting spectral notches in the, uh, in the audio signal and uh, increase the localization of sound sources, especially in the median plane. The cochlear nucleus can have direct connections to the superior olivary complex that we see next and the inferior colliculus, uh, which also uh, takes part in uh, these localization uh, phenomena. Sorry. Next we have the superior olivary complex, which of course is mostly responsible for our uh, localization uh, abilities. We have the, la uh, the lateral and the median uh, superior olive. Uh, their operation is based actually on the uh, interoral differences, which mean that we, you can have interoral time differences and interoral level differences. Interoral level differences are actually uh, processed by the LSO, and the interoral time differences are actually uh, handled by the MSO. This duality, this dualism, actually follows uh, even a spectral uh, discrimination, which mean that uh, time delays are very easily handled for lower frequencies and level uh, differences between the two ears are handled mainly uh, by the LSO. Especially for the time delays, the uh, most classical and still holding uh, computational and functional model is that of Jeffress from 1948. Um, which actually uh, realizes a coincidence detector. In maths, we can call that a correlation function. Uh, while for the level differences, we have also inhibitory synapses. And this is the way that actually lateralization uh, is uh, actually performed. Next, the inferior colliculus which is a uh, center even uh, central. The inferior colliculus is also responsible for interoral delay and amplitude modulation detections. Uh, it is also mainly uh, based on coincidence detectors and can, be in, uh, can have an involvement in the pitch and timbre perception. Next, of course, we can go up to the cortex where even more complex uh, performance is realized. Now, as for the software realizations of all these conceptual things, actually, uh, at the moment, there are three main bunches of software uh, realized mainly in computer packages like the MATLAB. The one is the auditory image model, the uh, MATLAB auditory periphery model, and the auditory modeling toolbox, each one uh, handled and developed by uh, various scientists in the field. Here you can see uh, the concept of software realization of these models. First you have the functional modules 
And then you can have the representations that these functional computational modules can give us, ranging from the basilar membrane displacements, uh, the firings in the auditory nerve, and finally, even the representation in the olivary complex. I would like to show you here a, a, an example of uh, such a modeling that we have uh, performed in our lab regarding a signal which has also amplitude modulations and frequency modulations without noise in silence and with noise. Here you can see the representation at the input of the cochlear nuclei. You can see clearly that the uh, efferent effects from the uh, MOC are very uh, easily discerned in the silence and even in the case of noise, but I will return here later on. So, next we go to subcortical recordings and why they are, they are uh, very important. The subcortical recordings actually may be divided into transient and following sustained recordings. The most classical recording type is the normal ABR and the next uh, sustained recording that we are uh, mostly interested in is the FFR, the frequency following response. The frequency following response is actually a representation from the brainstem uh, structures of the auditory signal itself. It has some very important uh, properties. For example, uh, the FFR measures are related more strongly to complex and cognitive skills. Uh, the FFR also uh, can give us a representation of pitch and frequency uh, tracking within the brainstem. Its origin uh, seems to be uh, rather uh, constantly uh, now in the brainstem and actually in the uh, regions of lateral limniscus and inferior colliculus, and there is a whole uh, new set of um, proofs for that. The FFR is actually very dependent on the amount of training. For example, you can see here a recording from a musician and a non-musician. You can see the amount and the amplitude of the uh, recording uh, that is vastly different. So what is the link between the auditory models and uh, this thing about the recordings and the uh, subcortical, uh, from the subcortical systems? So here comes, here comes the link. Their combination allows a dual approach, namely to calibrate and uh, justify models, and then use the models to predict performance. That is, first, we estimate valid and reasonable parameter values for our models based on fine tunings from recordings. And then we can use these uh, standardized models in order to make computations and predictions for uh, performance in cases where recording is not feasible or even uh, be um, very difficult. However, this approach has some drawbacks. First of all, uh, the computational models are very time consuming. Even today, with the very fast computers that we have in hand, uh, it can take us more than one or two minutes to make a computation like this for a signal of about one second. Next, you can have the effect of mathematical and arithmetical um, specificity, namely a noise error which affects the parameter estimation in terms of uncertainty. And of course, the transition between the models and the recordings always encompasses some kind of underdeterminacy. We cannot always be very sure about what actually is happening in terms of, of physiology. However, its use is very uh, easily um, justified and I will return here to the example that I was talking to you about. From such representations made with computational models, we related uh, the differences between the representations with behavioral experiments of timbre perception. 
The result was that we could manage, after optimization of parameters for the computational models, we could manage to have a correlation coefficient between the behavioral responses and the model representations of more than 70%. So, in this presentation, we tried to consider uh, the current status and propose further um, advances in the use, combined use of auditory models and subcortical recordings, which can be used in order to employ better information processing comprehension in the auditory system, can be used in clinical practice, and offer visualization of some very important phenomena that uh, could be used in learning, in auditory processing disorders, um, and generally in the, si in the science of hearing comprehe and comprehension. I will leave you with a mosaic of knowledge, as I uh, call it. Uh, these are some of the many people that actually contributed much to our knowledge about models and neurophysiology. Of course, they are not the only one. So I think that I owe uh, a very big thank, thank you uh, for all their contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pastiadis for a very uh, elaborate representation of all the difficult and uh, different <laughs> Uh, relay stations that uh, an auditory stimulus has to pass through in order to, to, to be perceived as such. And uh, of course, from a clinical practice point of view, uh, we would uh, very much like to see uh, what happens in, for instance, in auditory hallucinations where uh, no external stimulus is present and yet uh, this elaborate system perceives uh, speech mainly, but uh, not only. Uh, are there any uh, questions on this uh, presentation? It's always very, very difficult to, to be able to uh, ask questions on uh, neuroanatomy, that, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and per perhaps even more uh, difficult to ask questions on uh, software. <laughs> when we don't have uh, experts in uh, software, I mean. Uh, but this is all very, very uh, interesting, and I, I think uh, it, it will help in the uh, clinical practice in the future as uh, well. Uh, I would like to make just a point on uh, what uh, you uh, commented before. Uh, this speech regarded actually models and information processing chain in terms of an input signal. Mm -hmm. uh, signals and uh, sensation that is actually created within the brain should be modeled and studied in a totally different uh, manner. Mm -hmm. For example, auditory hallucinations, tinnitus. Uh, all these things uh, must be uh, studied into a different manner. Of course, there are some computational models that, but uh, we still are uh, at uh, a point where we are making actually guesses. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole thing, uh, I mean the information transfer from the uh, sound environment to the, uh, to the brain is much more easily uh, traceable uh, for uh, for study in terms of mathematics and modeling. Mm -hmm. That's true. I, I, I would like just to, uh, to point out uh, to the fact that if you uh, go out and have a coffee with your, with your friends in a place that is noisy and there are a lot of other groups of people uh, discussing things, so there is bubble in the background, uh, and if you just record this with your uh, smartphone, what you are going to perceive is much noise. What what you actually perceive is much less noisier than what you will hear from your smartphone, uh, because obviously our uh, brain is not just uh, receiving input signals, but it's filtering them and it's focusing on specific. Uh, signals 
that is nearby speech. Yes, take the, for example, the example, take yes. for example the cocktail party effect, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is a manifestation of the whole uh, system of auditory scene analysis and all these complex um, processes that come not only from down from bottom to the top, but all, also from top to bottom. And this is actually the reason why computational auditory models are still useful and employed in uh, everyday applications like in speech recognition. Otherwise, we wouldn't need them. Okay. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. And I'm going to call a uh, uh, PhD uh, candidate, PhD student, uh, Sidiras Christos, who is going to uh, tell us on uh, rhythm in speech perception it's actually uh, a part of his uh, PhD, which is uh, just in the first year. Uh, and he's going to uh, let us know how uh, rhythm may affect uh, speech perception in children, in typical children, and in children having actually uh, being diagnosed with auditory processing uh, disorders. I would like to, <clears throat> to thank Professor von Drulakis for the invitation in this Congress, and of course, uh, Professors Iliadou and Pastiadis. Uh, music and language have been shown by different lines of research to be correlated. These lines uh, include linguistics, acoustics, psychoacoustics, and encephalography studies. Uh, behavioral studies point to a correlation between syntax and rhythm processing. Przybilski et al. ran a study on three groups of children, uh, the first group with specific language impairment, the second one with dyslexia and the control group. They assessed for rhythm effects on syntax processing. Sentences were, with syntactic errors were presented, preceded by rhythm sequences in this experiment. And the sequences differed in terms of regularity, in the case of uh, being either regular or irregular. In the case of the regular sequences, it was easy to extract the underlying meter. A regular sequence would sound something like ta, 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 which is very rhythmical. Uh, in the case of non-regular sequences, it was hard to extract the meter. Something, it would some, uh, sound something like ta, 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 ta. Uh, the researchers found that error detection uh, was better when the preceding uh, sequence was regular compared to when the uh, sequence was irregular. That is, when rhythm was easy to perceive, syntactic processing was enhanced compared to when uh, rhythm was not easy to perceive. And the effect was present in all three groups despite differences in uh, neurodevelopment. Kodz and Gander ran an EEG study on a patient with a idiopathic Parkinson. They orally delivered sentences with syntactic and semantic errors in three conditions. In the first condition, a piece of music with magic rhythmic characteristics preceded the sentence. In the second one, the piece of music had non-matching characteristics with the sentence. And in the third condition, no music was presented at all. Uh, the researchers measured 
P600 and P400 responses, which according uh, to them correspond to syntactic and semantic processing respectively. They found better responses which suggests uh, better semantic and syntactic processing when music matched sentences compared to the other two conditions. Psychoacoustic studies have also shown correlations between uh, discrimination of rhythmic phrases versus speech and noise recognition and literacy skills versus rhythm perception. That is, better discrimination between rhythmic phrases is linked to better uh, speech and noise recognition and better rhythm perception is linked to better, better literacy skills. Speech rhythms are also linked to auditory cortex characteristics. Linguistic studies have shown that uh, the syllabic rate in speech ranges between 3 and 5 hertz. And these rates do not uh, differ much across languages and speakers. Studies in speech acoustics reveal that the dominant uh, component in speech is around the same frequency. Encephalo encephalography studies reveal that the auditory cortex is tuned at this specific frequency by showing a peak uh, in sensitivity for both verbal and nonverbal signals uh, with periodicities at around 4 Hz. And this, of course, implies that the auditory system is built in such a way so that it can exploit speech rhythms. Speech segmentation is the process by which a continuous speech signal uh, is segmented into separate chunks of information, such as sentences, phrases, words, syllables, and phonemes. A temporal scaffolding mechanism has been proposed by which speech segmentation in separate syllables occurs. A scaffolding is present in the brain while a speech signal enters Note that uh, syllables are more or less isochronous, that is, they have uh, qu uh, quite constant rate. Speech enters the brain and is segmented in separate syllables through the scaffolding mechanism. In order for this mechanism to function, alignment, temporal alignment between scaffolding and speech has to be accomplished. Giraud and Poppel have proposed a model of the neural mechanics by which the, this alignment between speech and scaffolding is accomplished. In a simplified version, incoming speech signal produces theta oscillations in the auditory cortex that track uh, speech modulations. Theta oscillations lead to temporally organized spiking activity in layers two and three. And this procedure results to the alignment between uh, spikes and syllables. That is, uh, alignment between scaffolding and speech. Dynamic attention theory is a, framing, a framework that was developed some decades ago uh, to explain rhythm effects in perception. This theory and the segmentation model mentioned previously share common characteristics as they both occupy auditory processing and neural oscillations. According to dynamic attention theory, attention is not constant over time. Uh, in the presence of rhythm, uh, but it, rhythm rather produces periodic fluctuations in attention. This means that sensory input temporarily aligned with peaks in attention is better processed than sensory input that is aligned with valleys in attention. Recent research has shown that these fluctuations in attention are linked to neural oscillations in the auditory cortex, in the case at least of auditory processing. This is an uh, electroencephalogram in which neural oscillations are produced by rhythmic short uh, tones. And these are the tones. And this is the last one. This is important 
that the sequence ends here. Each tone corresponds to a peak uh, in neural activity with some delay that corresponds uh, to the time between the sound entering the ear and arriving to the cortex. What is in interesting here is that even when uh, physical stimuli is no more present, the pattern of uh, neural activity does not stop, but it rather continues. Consequently, according to dynamic attention theory, once a rhythm is established, neural oscillations and subsequently oscillations in attention are present, despite of the stimuli being absent. In order to test uh, dynamic attention theory for speech, we developed in our lab uh, a test in MATLAB, the word recognition rhythm component test. In this test, a word in bubble is presented, preceded by a four-bit sequence. Three conditions were developed that differed in terms of rhythm. In the first condition, rhythm is present. In the second uh, condition, rhythm is absent. And in the third condition, rhythm is present, but the, word, the following word is not synchronized with it. 16 bisyllabic words are presenting, presented in each condition. The task of the test is the correct recognition of both syllables of the word. This is the first condition, the rhythm condition. Here we see the four-bit sequence the word, and the bubble. Bits are isochronous and aligned with the word. This means that if the sequence did not stop, uh, both syllables would uh, co-occur with a beat. In this case, bits and word are perceived as part of the same rhythm. Let's listen to an example. Prax. Prax. Our hypothesis was that in this condition, rhythm would enhance speech recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the second condition, non-rhythm condition, uh, where uh, beats are not isochronous, hence no rhythm is present when the word is presented. Let's... This condition was uh, used to measure recognition in the absence of uh, rhythm, offering an indicator of baseline performance. In the third condition, unsynchronized, unsynchronized condition, bits are isochronous, but they are not aligned with the word. This means that if the sequence did not stop, syllables would not co-occur with bits. Hence, bits and word are not perceived as part of the same rhythm. This condition uh, was implemented in order to assess for the importance of synchronicity between word and rhythm. Two studies uh, were run using the WRC test. In the first study, we tested the general child population. The experiment took place in a school. Participants were, were uh, fifth grade students aged 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Here are the results of our study. In the vertical axis, the total um, uh, uh, the total number of syllables that were recognized correctly are shown for each of the three conditions. The maximum possible score is 32 for each condition, which corresponds to 32 correctly recognized syllables. Our results show that recognition was better in rhythm condition compared to both non-rhythm and unsynchronized condition.
nggak kita mau kacau. Sebenarnya nggak kita. Untuk lebih. Uh, rhythm condition scores were better than uh, non-rhythm scores and unsynchronized scores. No difference were, was observed between the last two con conditions, non-rhythm and unsynchronized. That is, presence of rhythmic beats enhances recognizability of the word only when sequence and word are synchronized. Uh, the enhancement in uh, recognition due to the presence of rhythm was larger for the first syllable uh, compared to the second one. Differences were also found between sexes. Girls performed better in uh, rhythm condition for the second syllable only compared to boys. Our study suggests that the rhythm effects are present only when synchronization between rhythm and speech occurs. Our results are in accordance with previous research that showed positive synchronized rhythm effects in SIDAX processing. However, effects in our study concern a much lower stage of processing, that is, sensory processing. In the second experiment, which is still in progress, we investigated whether the same effects are present in child APD population. APD stands for Auditory Processing Disorder. This study was conducted uh, with the use of the same test in children aged between 5 and 12 years old. Our preliminary results suggest that uh, rhythm effects are not present in APD population as word recognition in rhythm condition is not better than in non-rhythm condition. No difference was also observed between uh, unsynchronized vs non-rhythm condition. Overall, our study suggests that rhythm effects in speech are present in general child population, but not in children with auditory processing disorder. This means that APD children may have a deficit in exploiting speech rhythms. We suggest that music education and especially rhythm training may improve speech perception in children with APD. Rhythmic speech may also improve speech recognition. And last, we suggest the use of rhythm, rhythmic speech in auditory training. Thank you for your attention. I would like to thank Mr. Sidiras for his uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, in that case, we will proceed with the next one, with the next presentation. And I would like to call uh, Mrs. Eli Ziazieri. Uh, she's going to uh, talk to us about status and perspectives on music and uh, learning uh, disabilities. First of all, hello. Uh, I'm Eleni or Elis Yazieri, and uh, as you already mentioned, uh, I will uh, talk about status and perspective on music and learning disabilities. The music approach stands in the line with research and virus alternative approaches to linguistic development, particularly in the case of people with linguistic uh, difficulties. But in order to understand why music can be used as Enhancing linguistic development, it is necessary to examine the similarities and the differences between language and music, as well as the reason why music can develop equally well as language or even support linguistic perception and development. The common point presented in these two cognitive domains may appear in other domains too. However, language and uh, uh, music share the same sense of perception and expression. 
In language, as well in music, we have the sense of hearing, which is considered necessary for the proper acoustic processing and ultimately the perception of musical and linguistic phrases. In both systems, the time, the length and the range of each acoustic representation must be perceived. Apart from when musical instrument, of course, the processing uh, is from the movement of muscles of the body. Another sense uh, that seems to share is the vision. In both systems, uh, there are codes that the person has to be able to understand. Each symbol has its own phonological match in both codes. That is a specific name for each letter or note, and more importantly, a specific mode of reproduction of its sounds by the human body. A specific placement, for example, if we have the letter K, we have a specific way to do that. In music also, we have a specific frequency. Here, we're talking about phonological awareness, uh, that is, the recognition of each note or letter, and it's corresponded with a particular sound. Apart from the perception, we have other cognitive and executive function uh, in these two systems. Imitation, memory, strategy development for easier processing, learning or even storing the information, the acoustic representation. In order to do that, we have to do uh, to have the ability to simultaneously process and store the information, we are talking about working memory, to have attention, anticipation of what will follow, and the imitation capacity. These environments have norms, some rules, that make processing of information easier. For example, if we have a musical phrase, and especially a conclusion phrase, we expect to hear a musical fall. Uh, the same is about uh, the speeds. When we have a sentence, we, we will expect uh, to see where we will stop, or even a sequence of particular tones after another, or syllables. So it's more than obvious that uh, uh, we have uh, a cooperation of memory, expectations, motor movements of the body, attention, vision, and other executive and cognitive mechanisms in order to create speech and music. According to a study of Brown et al. in 2006, brain activity was observed with the use of electromagnetic tomography while listening uh, to musical phrases and language suggestion. The subject had to listen and then uh, were asked to continue musical phrase uh, or sentence. In this, uh, in this experiment, we found that the primary motor cortex, the supplementary motor area, broca area, anterior insula, the primary and secondary odority cortis, temporal pole, basic ganglia, ventral thalamus, and posterior cerebrum uh, was active. Um, let's see some brain uh, region that uh, seems to share. Uh, first of all, we have to say that uh, um, during lig linguistic and musical works, uh, both cortical regions of brain uh, hemispheres uh, were used. Specifically, we have some odority region, Brotman area 41, 42, and Brotman area 4 for the motor production. Um, the region that operated in parallel for both projects and particularly overlapped it are the phonological reprodu reproduction areas. Brotman area 22 for sensory and Brotman area 44, 45 for, for phonological generativity. Though the areas uh, that uh, have been shown to differ is semantic and syntactic processing. Regarding the, enhan the enhancement of linguistic development through music and experimental finding showed that musicians seem to exhibit great activation of bilateral brain re regions related to linguistic and musical works, and also musicians, typical development, uh, developed or not, have a high performance in linguistic works and mainly in, read in reading. In, in particular, people with learning disabilities, uh, music can active brain language and music-based brain structure 
have a positive influence in temp temporal and rhythmical perception of sound, even if they are linguistic or not. Let's see the problems that people with uh, language uh, difficulty may have. Then uh, the general difficulties are in perception, memory, attention, uh, kinetic articulation, structure, and uh, the predominant problem is uh, in this individual is the problem of central acoustic processing, which of course contribute to processing of temporal changes in acoustic representations. Uh, in particular, uh, pathogenesis of a dyslexic individual affects oral memory for the rapid processing of acoustic stimuli. However, the dysfunction of the verbal memory, whether it concerns itself or originate from phonological deficits in this group of people, makes it difficult to quick decode the acoustic and visual production. Sure, a linguistic re a repetition and persistent, uh, persistence uh, practice may help to improve audio processing and phonological performance. Nevertheless, regarding to the, of the nature of the problem, children with music education had improved acoustic processing of musical and non-musical stimuli, faster uh, maturation in acoustic responses, better acoustic attention, good color, color, correlation of music and language performance, improved phonological awareness, reading ability, notion of noise and learning ability, and furthermore, a musician person can distinguish between rhythm changes, tonal violation, and tension. Music, uh, uh, as a method of improvement from a very early age, can give the individual also confidence and pleasure and better sense of uh, emotions. But let's see the results among populations. Children with learning disability were much slower than typical children in their responses. Their subcortical responses were reduced in high frequency representation. Reading, reading process uh, associated with subcortical responses. responses. Dyslexia or learning difficulties have, uh, have poor performance in perception of rhythm, general tone, musical score reading, linguistic reading uh, compared to typically developed children. If we would like to see the order, typical development, uh, developed children uh, with music education have the best performance. After that are typical developed children without musical training. And the important is that dyslexic dyslexic children with musical training have equal the same performance with them. And uh, the worst performance uh, is children with learning dif difficulties and without musical uh, music training. Age is an important factor in predicting people's performance in linguistic and musical works. Uh, as we have in language development some stages, the same goes for music. So, if children start uh, before the age of seven uh, to en uh, the engagement with music, have greater ease in tonic discrimination than children who start later. Furthermore, these children, children have greater uh, perceptual ability and pho phonological awareness. Uh, through the surveys, uh, a picture of series of achievement has been formed according to the age which justified the color, coloration of children, musicians, and linguistic words. Infancy can be maybe the juncture for the la later linguistic development. Here we can see also uh, the musical achievement in the age of four and five, uh, that we have a development of tonal treatment in the age of five, that we can distinguish musical tone, and also have reading ability and phonological awareness, awareness. Um, in, uh, in age, at age of 7 to 11, tonal memory, chord analysis, that is colorate with reading ability, and uh, in the end, at the age of 8, rhythmical perception in music and linguistic uh, reading. Uh, to sum up, at a very young uh, age, the learning uh, difficulties uh, could be the trigger trigger for a musical structure tool for di diagnosis learning difficulties and especially, uh, especially in dyslexia uh, that is a very confused field. 
the intensity of music and the energetic attitude of uh, these individuals can make the symptoms more profound. Also, uh, we should remember that uh, music may be uh, is a, a, motiva a, a good motivation for, for children in school age, and uh, of course it's preferable uh, uh, than a monotonous or critical education. Music also can help in perception sounds, uh, but uh, also to enhancement in phonological memory. Um, on the other hand, uh, people of school age who left uh, their musical education after one or two years had lower uh, performance in both music and linguistic tasks. And uh, to close with an optimist, uh, optimistic point of view, I should tell that musical children with learning disabilities have similar performance to non-musical, typical developed children in linguistic tasks and higher in music tasks. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Elis Yaziri for this uh, presentation, uh, which uh, to my point of view shows uh, exactly the plasticity of the central auditory nervous system, which is actually the plasticity of the central nervous system as well, uh, which uh, requires an energetic involvement in auditory stimuli in order for results to to show up in this uh, great way. Are there any uh, questions? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you very much. And concluding this uh, session, uh, I'm going to talk about hyperacusis in uh, autism spe spectrum uh, disorder. Uh, that is really a hypersensitivity in sounds. Uh, you will notice that this term that I'm using, even though it's a medical term, hyperacusis, and it really means adverse response to uh, auditory stimuli, uh, is not the one that we usually use in the uh, clinical practice, uh, especially with clinicians uh, dealing with children uh, in the auditory uh, spectrum. Now, uh, the absence of this term in the uh, DSM-5 uh, terminology uh, actually reduces the awareness that a clinician must have that children in uh, autism spectrum disorder should be uh, evaluated for their hearing. And they should be evaluated for their hearing sensitivity, which is the pure tone audiogram, the test that usually takes place when you refer a child for uh, a hearing problem or a possible hearing problem. And of course, for the auditory processing uh, abilities as well. Uh, it is true that uh, children uh, in the autism spectrum disorder have adverse responses in other modalities as well. But we will see that this uh, picture here that I'm showing with a child uh, firmly closing uh, her ears in order to, to avoid a auditory stimulus that is perceived as uh, really loud and disturbing is uh, something that really disturbs their everyday uh, life and in uh, both in and outside of the uh, classroom. Uh, however, I, I wouldn't uh, like for you to go away with uh, thinking that this uh, image here is uh, just a child having autism, uh, because this may be a very uh, normal uh, reaction if the intensity of certain sounds, whether they are uh, music or speech or traffic noise for that matter, uh, are really loud. So loud intensity may easily uh, result in such a movement by a child just to protect 
their hearing, and this should not be uh, perceived uh, as, uh, as a sign of autism uh, on its own. Now, when a clinician uh, has a suspicion that a child is not hearing very well, uh, the referral for a hearing test uh, is actually uh, what you see in the left, in the pictures in the left side of this uh, slide. So it's actually what we are measuring is how a child perceives very uh, simply, simple sounds, even simpler than uh, speech that, that you are seeing here. But the, the really important part is that it's in uh, really uh, ideal situations. So uh, it's close by to a, a speaker or it's in a really, really quiet room. Uh, one can understand that this is not uh, how a child perceives uh, speech and communicates in everyday life. And so we must have the hearing, which is actually termed auditory processing that we see in the uh, pictures in the right part of this slide that you are seeing. So uh, how children really uh, understand and perceive speech while other children are speaking simultaneously as well, or uh, while there is background noise both from inside the classroom or from outside. Uh, so it's important if we, if we want to really evaluate hearing to see hearing sensitivity together with uh, auditory processing evaluation as a whole. Uh, another important factor is that uh, there is a bias in our society uh, having to do with how we perceive a person that does not hear very well. So if, if I told you that I'm not seeing very well these slides that you are, uh, I'm putting up for you, uh, then most of you would say probably uh, you should uh, just go and check your um, vision to see if there is any problem there. But if someone tells you I didn't hear very well what you said, then most of us would uh, uh, very spontaneously respond, if only you paid better attention. So this shows that we, we really link and correlate uh, hearing with attention. And it's not, it's not something that is, uh, that is not linked. We will see, however, in which ways. Now, uh, you can see here that we really use the, the word deafness and hearing loss as if they were the same terms. By doing so, we want to stress the most severe part the most severe deficit of, the, of a hearing loss, which is the deafness part, of course. But alongside with that, what we are really doing is downgrading mild or moderate hearing losses, which we have found in our uh, clinical psychoacoustics lab uh, in the third psychiatric department in the uh, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki that in many, many cases, uh, patients, psychiatric patients, have uh, up to a percent of 40, 45%, have mild or moderate hearing losses which they are not aware of, neither themselves or their immediate relatives. So they have mild or moderate hearing losses which are not perceived as such, and their responses and their behavior is attributed only to the main disorder which is uh, mentally uh, related. Uh, it should be noted that the uh, World Health Organization still states that uh, a, a really impairing hearing loss is uh, having more than 30 decibels uh, as a threshold when the normal one is uh, 15 for a child, uh, so they allow for these 15 decibels uh, which are already in the uh, pathological spectrum to be thought as not really impacting everyday life 
even though today we know through research that children having mild or moderate hearing losses or, hear, or a hearing loss that is mild or moderate and that is only in one ear, so a unilateral hearing loss, the other ear is perfectly uh, typically hearing, they still have issues learning. So they will have learning difficulties 10 times more than a typically hearing uh, child. So it is important to, to know the terminologies and uh, really differentiate between what we are uh, using and uh, what a term uh, use may uh, result in. Now, uh, going back to hyperacusis in autism spectrum disorder, uh, how often do we find hyperacusis, hypersensitivity to sounds uh, in children in the uh, autism spectrum disorder? And we can see here uh, a very recent paper uh, stating that in Asperger's we have seven in 10 children experiencing hyperacusis. Now, I'm not saying that these seven children uh, will definitely have auditory deficits issues, but what I'm uh, really stressing is, is that these children should be evaluated to see what's the status of their uh, hearing. Another point has to do with the thought that we can really differentiate uh, between a child having a hearing loss and a child being in the autism spectrum disorder. So uh, generally, most of us think that a child having a hearing loss will just have uh, a perception of the auditory environment that he, he or she is into, uh, which is a little less in, in intensity. And that is really all that is lost. And we certainly wouldn't think that this would uh, account for any issue with emotion perception. However, we have this uh, recent research in 2016, which shows that deficits in emotion recognition may be uh, similar in children having a hearing loss and in children being diagnosed with autism. And this is further linked with the time of onset of the hearing loss. So the deficits are more pronounced the earlier the onset of the hearing loss, because obviously the child has not been able uh, to, to, to acquire the cognitive skills through listening correctly, appropriately, to be able to recognize uh, emotion, which is linked with uh, being able to perceive the fundamental frequency fluctuations while someone is uh, speaking. Uh, I've already mentioned that it's not abnormal responses in autism spectrum disorder are not limited in the auditory modality. I'm sure that you all are aware of this. Uh, but however, they are more, uh, they are particularly stressful in these children. And this is why it's important to uh, be able to, to deal with them, to, to find appropriate management. Now, another fact has to do uh, with the, uh, the fact that technology has provided us with the uh, ability that we didn't have in the 80s or 90s to be able to uh, screen for a hearing loss when a, in a newborn uh, child, when a child is uh, born. This uh, hearing screening is uh, done, however, in the general population. And its purpose is to really uh, test 1,000 children in order to find the five or seven that should, be, uh, should go through the uh, whole diagnostic evaluation to see whether they have a hearing loss and what type and degree this hearing loss is. Uh, However, in uh, children that are uh, verified as having communicational and listening deficits, one should not just screen for hearing. We should really evaluate 
and it's a completely different approach to diagnostically uh, evaluate a child for a hearing impairment and for auditory processing disorder and a completely different thing to just screen for the disorder. So diagnosis should be made in children with verified communication and listening deficits. Otherwise, we are just losing uh, on the uh, general profile of the child and we are not providing him or her with appropriate management. Uh, and it has been shown that it's uh, in, more, in more than half cases, half of the cases uh, in children with autism spectrum disorder, we have hearing impairment, which is actually uh, a lot uh, higher in incidence as is in the general population, which is about 15%. Now, it is true that while evaluating for uh, central auditory processing disorders, there are going to be some language and cognitive confounds, and we, uh, we, we would like this to be as minimized as possible. And we, we have established practical guidelines to do so, to be able to test in these uh, children. Uh, there is no doubt that it's a difficult population to, to test and evaluate. And you can see here a, a study of 2017, this year, where 68%, uh, uh, 7 in 10 children having autism spectrum disorder have issues with perceiving speech in uh, bubble. And their uh, anxiety, their perceived anxiety, as well as their salivary cortisol levels were reduced when this was managed through the use of a remote microphone system that really uh, helped them hear better in the classroom. Now, just to show you uh, here that uh, normal speech is, is at about 60, 50, 60 decibels uh, hearing level, and a vacuum cleaner, for example, is at 70, so that this shouldn't be a, a loud noise, a disturbing one. However, in autism, this is uh, in many cases, a really disturbing sound, uh, which uh, the a child may grow out of it when growing up. It's not easy to test uh, for auditory processing in autism spectrum disorder. It's particularly challenging, and it's the reason why, in many cases, uh, hearing loss or auditory processing deficits remain undiagnosed in these children. Uh, they do have a lack of the inherent focus that a typically developing child has on speech. So the example that I used earlier on in this session, that we are not just perceiving every stimulus that we are hearing, but our, our brain is really focused on speech. Uh, in such a way that we are able to uh, really uh, put out of focus any other uh, sound that we think it's meaningless. Uh, so if verbal abilities exist in, autism spectrum in an autism spectrum disorder child, then we are able to do our full diagnostic approach with uh, psychoacoustic tests. If, however, such abilities are uh, absent, then uh, we are left only with the objective measurement with electrophysiology, uh, mostly. So just as a takeaway uh, note, diagnosis for children with verified communication and listening deficits and not just screening. Uh, this slide, in fact, uh, and I'm coming to the end of my talk. This slide, in fact, uh, shows what I um, mentioned in the beginning of this session, that, uh, in fact, uh, how we hear really impacts on how we attend to stimuli. And uh, this impacts on how our short-term memory is strong or, or not strong. And this all together permits us to start thinking on the perceived 
auditory uh, stimulus. But this works both ways. So if uh, someone is really thinking about a particular subject, then he uh, can improve his memory on this subject that he is thinking on. And he can improve his short-term attention as well. And in, in a sense, he improves through a top-down model, through uh, uh, the cognitive abilities approach, the way he or she is really uh, hearing, perceiving auditory stimuli. So it works both bottom-up and top-down. And in order to conclude, in autism spectrum disorder, we should test for, evaluate for hearing threshold to see how, some, uh, how a child perceives speech in quiet, but we should also evaluate for auditory processing uh, disorders uh, because of the fact that uh, two of the most uh, important symptoms in uh, auditory processing disorders are uh, present in autism spectrum disorder should uh, tell the story on why we, we should diagnose these children for hearing in general. So hyperacusis and speech in noise or bubble difficulties are present in most cases in autism spectrum uh, disorder children. Thank you for listening. Well, if I am allowed, I would like to uh, ask a question uh, about this very uh, interesting topic. Um, have you observed any uh, referral uh, about uh, the possibility of hyperacusis, uh, hyperacusis subsiding uh, after treatment and uh, behavioral addressing of uh, autism uh, spectrum disorder? In general, this is the, the story, I think. I mean, it would be very uh, useful and interesting if we could uh, use um, some, of, uh, some of our experience in treating the autism spectrum disorder in order to uh, also treat um, other types of hearing deficits that come with uh, hyperacusis or tinnitus, of course, in cases where there is no autism. Yes, that's true. But, but it's, it works the other way around as well. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, in autism spectrum disordered children, you may have a, a cochlear hearing loss. Or you may not. But you may have. Mm -hmm. And in such cases, uh, I, I have uh, seen cases like that that come for uh, auditory processing evaluation. Mm -hmm. They are unaware of having a hearing loss. And in some cases, they, uh, their hyperacusis is treated uh, in a way that actually wo worsens their hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's important to, 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 to know their hearing abilities, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I think that, that concludes our session. Thank you all for uh, being very good listeners.
speaking. Thank you very much for coming. I would like to congratulate the organizing committee uh, for uh, another, as it seems to be, excellent Congress in a row. Uh, our uh, symposium is uh, called Medication and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Anxiety Disorders, a loan or in combination. It is uh, well known that uh, two of uh, those treatments that are uh, treatments of first, uh, first choice for anxiety disorders are both uh, psychopharmacotherapy as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. Psychotherapy in general, although cognitive behavioral therapy seems to be uh, the one that has the most robust uh, results in, uh, concerning its uh, effectiveness in uh, anxiety disorders. Uh, we will de uh, deal with uh, mainly three of those anxiety disorders, panic disorder with or without agoraphobia, uh, generalized anxiety disorder as well as social anxiety disorder. Um, I think OCD is missing, but OCD is not uh, anymore included in uh, anxiety disorders in the DSM-5. Uh, we have PTSD where uh, things are a bit confused still. And uh, specific phobias, I guess that uh, exposure therapy, I mean behavior therapy for specific phobias uh, is, is the best thing we have. Anyway, I would uh, like to invite uh, the first uh, presenter, uh, Ms. Meropisimo, and she's going to present on medication and cognitive behavioral therapy for panic disorder agoraphobia. Welcome uh, to, to this Congress also. I'm Merope Simo, I'm a psychologist. And I will be talking about uh, medication and cognitive behavior therapy for panic disorder and agoraphobia. Uh, first of all, we have to say that pharmacotherapy and cognitive behavior therapy are both very effective treatments for panic disorder with or without agoraphobia. We have inevitable limitations of these treatment modalities that have created a new interest in the enhancement of their efficacy and consequently in the research and search for a possible greater efficacy of combined therapy. So uh, my presentation today is going to be divided in three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about the efficacy of pharmacotherapy uh, as a monotherapy. Uh, second of all, about the efficacy of cognitive behavior therapy and uh, last but not least, about the efficacy of the combined therapy, CBT, and pharmacotherapy. Um, I have here the diagnostic criteria according to DSM-5 about panic disorder and agoraphobia, but I think I will skip those. Uh, as we know, uh, panic disorder is characterized by recurrent unexpected panic attacks. It has to uh, have at least four or more of the following symptoms, as you can see. And at least one of the attacks has to be followed by one month or more by persistent concern or worry about additional panic attacks or their consequences, and a significant maladaptive, maladaptive change in behavior. Uh, about agoraphobia, uh, it has to be, uh, it is about marked fear of, or anxiety about two or more of the following five situations, like public transportation, open spaces, and other uh, situations. And uh, one important thing about agoraphobia is that uh, the agoraphobic situation almost always provokes fear or anxiety, and they are actively avoided. A note that should be made is that in DSM-5, agoraphobia is diagnosed irrespective of the presence of panic disorder. Uh, so if an individual's presentation meets criteria for both panic disorder and agoraphobia, both diagnoses should be assigned. So what about the efficacy of pharmacotherapy? in panic disorder and agoraphobia. Uh, we know that there is ongoing research uh, on the pharmacotherapy of panic disorder, and it makes it timely to update an evidence-based approach um, to the pharmacotherapy of panic disorder and agoraphobia. 
Uh, also, pharmacological agents with a sufficient evidence to support their use in the treatment of panic disorder include antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, VSNRI venlafaxine, several TCAs, tricycl uh, tricyclic and antidepressants, and the irreversible uh, myphenelzine and benzodiazepines, of course. Uh, we know that antidepressants uh, acting on the serotonergic system are effective in treating panic disorder. These include the SSRIs, talopram, flu fluvoxamine, fluoxetine, paroxetine, sertraline. Uh, of course, the TCA is imipramine and clomipramine, the SNRI velafaxin, as I said, and the myphenylzine. So what about the SSRIs? There is sufficient evidence of the efficacy of the SSRIs uh, when it comes to panic disorder by both randomized clinical trials and meta-analysis of such studies. Uh, well, those studies compared both to placebo and to other equivalent standard, standard interventions, psychotherapy and uh, pharmacotherapy. Um, so we have here three double-blind placebo controlled trials that investigated paro paroxetine, and they were pulled, and allowing analysis of a total study population of uh, almost 900 panic disorder patients. So paroxetine in this study was superior to placebo on the primary outcome measure. Percentage of patients who were free of panic attacks in the two week prior to endpoint. And in another 10 week randomized controlled double blind trial, uh, escitalopram was found to be more effective than placebo. What about the SSRIs versus the TCAs? Uh, Baker et al. Uh, in 2002 found in a meta-analysis that there were no differences between the SSRIs and the TCAs on any of the effect sizes, which indicated that both groups of antidepressants are equally effective in reducing the panic symptoms, the agoraphobic avoidance, uh, and also the depressive symptomatology and the general anxiety of the person. Also, the percentage of the patients free of panic attacks at post-test did not differ. Uh, the number of dropouts, however, was significantly lower in the group of patients treated with the SSRIs. It was 18%, uh, whereas the TCAs, the dropout to, of the people uh, that were treated with TCAs was uh, higher, which leads to the conclusion that although the SSRIs and the TCAs, they are almost equally effective in the treatment of panic disorder, the SSRIs are tolerated better by the patient, patients. What about the SNRIs? Venlafaxine is uh, a dual-acting SNRI antidepressant. And uh, controlled trials have demonstrated the efficacy and safety of venlafaxine in the treatment of panic disorder, uh, which resulted in the, reduce, the reduction of the severity of panic symptoms of the patients. Venlafaxine is generally well tolerated. It has side effects, but they usually abate with continued treatment. And it is an important option to, after the SSRIs for the treatment of patients with panic disorder. It has been found significantly more effective than placebo in several randomized controlled double-blind trials, as you can see. And it has a well-developed evidence, evidence base. And it is uh, different pharmacologically from the SSRIs, which means that if the SSRIs are not so effective or are not tolerated by the person, it is a rather logical step to switch to venlafaxine with its additional noradrenergic reuptake inhibition. A further step after the SSRIs or the venlafaxine is to switch to, uh, to mirtazapine. It has evidence of effectiveness in panic disorder, uh, again, from a random, randomized comparative trial. And it seemed to be uh, as effective as fluoxetine in that study of 2010. One area that uh, has yet to receive adequate attention is whether enhanced efficacy could be anticipated if mirtazapine is combined with the SSRIs or SNRIs than used as uh, a monotherapy. So evidence for mirtazapine uh, augmenting the SSRIs or the SNRIs does exist in depression. Uh, so we think that this strategy is certainly acceptable when panic disorder and depression are comorbid. Apart from mirtazapine, the remaining antidepressant drugs uh, with known efficacy in panic disorder all belong to a less widely used class, classes, 
which may not be as familiar to most prescribers and therapists. So these drugs can be divided into three categories. We know that this, uh, the TCAs, clomipramine and imipramine, they are supported by good RCT data. They are also uh, serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake blockers. They have additional blockade of histamine, serotonin, acetylcholine receptors. We know that they are licensed in some European countries, but uh, due to their uh, anticholinergic side effects and the toxicity in overdose uh, in patients, they are seen as less desirable options uh, than the newer drugs uh, discussed above. And they're usually reserved for treatment-resistant cases for patients that don't show uh, that much change when using uh, the above uh, medicine. Uh, secondly, there are the selective noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor rivoxetine. It has proven efficacy, although it also tends to, provo to provoke some side effects similar to the anticholinergic effects of TCAs. And there are also placebo control RCT evidence for the uh, mild drug phenylzine and evidence from comparison studies to support moclobemid, which is a reversible inhibitor of uh, monomonox dash alpha. And it has shown, we know that it has shown conflicting results so far. So uh, there are some studies that give it similar efficacy to chlorimipramine and fluoxetine, and others that show no superiority compared to placebo. So it still uh, has some conflicting results about its efficacy. Uh, benzodiazepines also have evidence of efficacy for panic disorder and agoraphobia in RCTs. We have clonazepam, lorazepam, diazepam, and alprazolam. Uh, there is high quality evidence for clonazepam, not only as monotherapy, but also as an adjunct to SSRIs. And uh, benzodiazepines, they have an advantage over the other drugs they're able to provide relief and remission more rapidly than the other drugs. So uh, all, although we have to consider that alongside this good evidence base uh, about its effectiveness, there are problems of the class uh, associated with tolerance, uh, with uh, difficult withdrawal of the patient. So we should all consider all these facts. So although they are considered to be second line drugs, they can be useful at any time during treatment for short-term treatment of anxiety symptoms. When combined with the SSRIs, they speed up their effect. That's really important to know. And most specialists are willing to prescribe benzodiazepines for short periods of time. And for certain patients, we have no history of substance misuse. And especially uh, where the patient feels that their panic attacks are so great, they uh, cause uh, uh, so much distress, and that rapid relief is required very soon. They may also have a useful role uh, if given on, on initiation or soon after initiation of antidepressants. And if, they, uh, if we see that the jejunous anxiety syndrome has been observed or if it is anticipated from the patient's previous experience. Apart from that, we have antipsychotics. There is partial evidence about that, uh, uh, that atypical antipsychotics may benefit patients with uh, panic disorder, that, uh, which is resistant to other treatments. So it's another choice. And in, an, in a randomized clinical trial of uh, Proseretol, Risperidone was found to be as effective as paroxetine. While other open studies support the use of Risperidone, Quetiapine, and Olanzapine. About that, uh, there is good quality evidence for the antipsychotic monotherapy. Um, though it is relatively sparse, there, is, there are some evidence uh, with only risperidone demonstrating equivalence to an SSRI in an RCT. Then we have quetiapine and olanzapine. They have a more limited evidence base, uh, but uh, evidence to support antipsychotic augmentation of the SSRIs is also restricted to open studies. So uh, this is an area that needs more uh, research and consideration. What about uh, another approach to pharmacotherapy? We know that many medicine about, uh, f for panic disorder are proven to be effective, but what about a more personalized approach, an approach that takes in consideration the needs uh, of the patient? Uh, we have personalized medicine, and it assumes that individuals' unique characteristics are central in tailoring the effective pharmacological interventions. 
This means that the identification of predictors of pharmacotherapy effectiveness is really crucial in panic disorder, but consensus on this topic is still lacking. And the personalized uh, approach to pharmacotherapy, although it is at an early stage, it appears to be really promising and a really promising way of increasing the rate of successful outcomes in this disorder, similar to trends in other fields of medicine. And it aims to tailor drugs to maximize therapeutic efficacy and minimize the side effects according to each patient's unique characteristics and symptomatology. So the personalized treatments may be carried out by identifying the evidence-based predictors of uh, the treatment response and toler to tolerability to select those patients who may mostly benefit treatment uh, than another. Predictors can include both clinical variables and biological vari variables. The clinical uh, are easily measurable with the gender, the sociodemographic characteristics, the biological variables, be uh, measured with additional more complex testing, such as neurobiological functions, biomarkers, and genetic and pharmacogenetic characteristics. At least uh, until now, only limited investigations have explored the biological predictors of pharmacotherapy outcome in PD, in panic disorder, uh, but we still need more sufficient data to provide reliable results. Literature, literature about the personalized approach suggests that uh, the sociodemographic and the clinical factors, these two, uh, may be associated with the pharmacological response to different medications in both anxiety and depressive disorders. And uh, when it comes to panic disorder, there are several studies that have examined the potential clinical predictors of response to different pharmacotherapies including the clinical sever severity of the disorder, the sociodemographic characteristics again, the gender, the cognitive psychological features, the level of improvement in the first few weeks, uh, which is also really important uh, as a predictor, and the comorbidity with other uh, disorders, both depressive uh, disorder or other personality uh, characteristics or disorders. And however, the results seem to be mixed and uh, still a reliable consensus cannot be uh, made regarding which clinical predictors, if any, are worthy of being considered by clinicians. So again, this should be taken into consideration and uh, suggest some more uh, data analysis on that and some research. Here we can see uh, uh, the different pharmacotherapy approaches, the, the first line, the um, drugs in red are considered to be the first line treatment for uh, panic disorder. We have this, the SSRIs, the SNRI, and the uh, venlafaxine, and also some others, but the first line uh, medication you can see is in red, both for acute panic disorder and long-term panic disorder. The first ones, the SSRIs and the SNRI venlafaxine seem to be the best way to approach this pharmacologically. What about treatment-resistant panic disorder? Uh, many, many studies, most of the studies have shown that continuation for six months up to two years of treatment, which was effective in the short term, may be beneficial and is recommended by the guidelines. But in treatment-resistant cases, what can we do? It's recommend, recommended to remain at the same dose for some more weeks and see if we can have any results. After that, we can increase the dose and wait for another four or six weeks. We can then switch to another drug if we see no improvement. We can either increase the dose of drug in combination with another drug, and if uh, those things doesn't, don't work, we can refer the patient for CBT, which comes to our other subject. What about the efficacy of cognitive behavior therapy? There are some evidence uh, for several forms of psychotherapy in panic disorder, including CBT, uh, and its con constituent components of cognitive therapy and behavior therapy, the third wave CBT techniques, uh, including mindfulness-based approaches, as well as psychodynamic therapy, psychoeducation, and supportive therapy. 
CBT has been characterized to be the golden standard of uh, psychological treatment for panic disorder and other uh, anxiety disorders. But when it comes to panic disorder, it could be with or without agoraphobia. And the main goal of CBT is to help patients recognize, control, and modify their dysfunctional thoughts and beliefs associated with the panic attacks, as well as the avoidance behaviors that may perpetuate their mistaken assumptions and the reactions to uh, the and the reactions. So the model of treatment includes both cognitive, uh, which is cognitive restructuring mostly, and behavioral techniques such as exposure therapy, interceptive exposure, and breathing exercises. Among the, the cognitive behavioral interventions, we, we know that those that combine cognitive restructuring with exposure therapy, they have the strongest results. And with regard to the maintenance of the results of the intervention after therapy, it appears that over a period of at least six months, the benefits of treatment of CBT, they were maintained at uh, the same level as those achieved in the end of the treatment. And uh, uh, in a meta-analysis by Gold uh, and et al., they concluded that CBT for panic disorder offers a really powerful result in terms of reducing the frequency of panic attacks, uh, as well as the overall results that appear to be uh, both long-term and effective in a way that they had low relapse uh, rates. Which takes us to uh, another part. We can see here uh, it is a mental analytic results of uh, panic disorder treatment studies. This was uh, uh, taken by uh, the meta-analysis of uh, Golden Otto. And here we can see that the CBT uh, as a monotherapy it had uh, effect sizes uh, a bit less than CBT uh, when it concluded uh, interoceptive exposure and cognitive restriction. But uh, as you can see, the uh, antidepressants, the benzodiazepines and the SSRIs and the antidepressants, they were lower uh, in effect sizes than uh, CBT. Oh. In a more uh, recent meta-analysis, which was in 2010, the effectiveness of psychotherapeutic interventions in the treatment of panic disorder with or without agoraphobia was studied. They studied different psychotherapeutic interventions apart from CBT. They included 42 studies from 1980 to 2006, and in these studies, the interventions they used, uh, they were in combination of various cognitive and behavioral strategies. And the control group uh, included waiting list patients or placebo-treated patients. The results confirmed the clinical effectiveness of CBT interventions in the treatment of uh, both panic attacks and agoraphobia. But they also treated, uh, they showed results in generalized anxiety, depression, bodily sensations, and general patient adjustment. That was uh, about uh, CBT, but what about the group CBT? not the, the one with one, one patient. So Suarez et al. Uh, in 2013, they conducted a post-analysis on the effectiveness of group CBT for panic disorder. They included 14 group CBT studies. And the results showed that treatment was particularly effective in treating the symptoms of panic and anxiety, and secondarily in treating the symptoms of depression and agoraphobia uh, when that was uh, there. The studies included also follow-up uh, evaluations after 3, 6, 12, 18, and 24 months uh, uh, later. And it appears that the improvement, the improvement of the symptoms was uh, maintained. So the long-term efficacy of CBT uh, has been shown uh, by research, and it shows that the benefits uh, with or without agoraphobia uh, remain three years later. In another follow-up uh, study by March and et al., they found that two years after the end of treatment, both individual and group CBT were associated with lower relapse rates compared to the patients who were in waiting list. And another survey about the long-term efficacy of CBT uh, from Fava et al. showed that patients were free of panic attacks after exposure treatment, which is really important in CBT. 
and 93% will still, were still free uh, of symptoms two years after the end of treatment. And after 10 years after the end of treatment, 62% uh, uh, of the patients were still free of symptoms. What about the efficacy of combination of CBT and pharmacotherapy? We have seen that uh, some forms of uh, pharmacotherapy seem to be more effective in panic disorder uh, with or without agoraphobia, and some, uh, some studies show the same for, CBT, for the effectiveness of CBT in uh, panic disorder. What about the combination therapy now? Uh, combining pharmacotherapy and CBT is really a popular strategy for treating anxiety disorders overall. Between 55% and 95% of patients are estimated to receive such combination th therapy. And it is generally believed that two effective therapeutic approaches that target different mechanisms of therapeutic change should be more effective than each treatment alone. So CBT and antidepressants, we have a review by uh, Mita Christine in 2005. They reviewed a lot of studies, 124 studies, and it seemed that the combination of CBT and pharmacotherapy, it was slightly more effective than psychotherapy. However, in the follow-up, when they uh, re-evaluated the patients, there was no significant difference uh, between the, combine, the combination therapy and the CBT as a monotherapy. CBT was found to be at least as effective as pharmacotherapy, and no differences uh, were found in efficacy between the benzodiazepines, the TCAs, and the SSRIs. However, it is known that there is an increased risk for the uh, benzodiazepines about the addiction and the other side effects I mentioned before. In another review by Furukawa et al., they compared the combination of CBT again and antidepressants with monotherapies. And it seemed that in the acute treatment phase, which was uh, a, between 8 and 12 weeks of treatment, the combination therapy was found to be superior than monotherapies. But after completion of treatment, the combined treatment was more effective than drug monotherapy, but it was as effective as psychotherapy. Furukawa and his colleagues, they suggest that both the combination therapy and CBT as monotherapy, they serve as first-line therapies for panic disorder with or without agoraphobia, with, of course, the choice of treatment depending on the patient's preference. Uh, in another meta-analysis, uh, in two other meta-analysis reviews by Paul and Dams and Hoffman et al., again about uh, the effectiveness of uh, the two uh, types of therapy, it seemed that the combination of CBT and pharmacotherapy was found to be superior to monotherapy with antidepressants and to CBT alone, but only for the acute treatment phase. And in long-term studies investigating the combination therapies for those patients, they found little benefit in the combined uh, therapies against monotherapies. But there were high rates of relapse in the combination therapy than in CBT as monotherapy. Uh, which is really interesting, and we can talk about this later. Um, in another uh, comparative study uh, from Appledore, Van Appledore, they compared patients who received monotherapy with SSRIs, uh, monotherapy, CBT as monotherapy, or this uh, combination. And uh, it showed that patients treated with the SSRIs and combination therapy, they demonstrated higher rate of, of improvement compared to those who had only CBT. Um, in patients who received combination therapy, the addition of CBT improved the confidence of the patients in managing potential withdrawal effects or other side effects when reducing the drug dose. And uh, discontinuation of the pharmacotherapy in combined therapy did not result in the resurgence of panic attacks. Uh, in uh, another study by Katzman et al. In, from 2014, it was seen that uh, the combination of CBT and pharmacotherapy was superior to the monotherapies during the acute treatment phase again, uh, while the pharmacotherapy continued. And at the end of treatment, the combined thera therapy was more effective than the drug therapy and as effective as psychotherapy on its own. And the same results have been shown by earlier meta-analysis and other review studies. Uh, which suggests that CBT alone or in combination with pharmacotherapy should be considered as a first-line therapy. 
Then Quivers et al. Uh, found that combination therapy was more effective, again, than uh, monotherapy with antidepressants. It had lasting effects up to two years after the end of treatment. And they also found evidence that uh, the effects of combination therapy compared to placebo, they were almost double as uh, those of pharmacotherapy compared to placebo. And about benzodiazepines, we know that the combination of CBT and pharmacotherapy is mostly used to facilitate the discontinuation of the benzodiazepines. Otto et al. in 2010 found that the addition of CBT sessions was uh, facilitating the, discontinuations, the discontinuation of benzodiazepines in those patients. And it was associated with lower relapse rates during the follow-up uh, six months later after the end of treatment. And this con these findings are consistent with previous studies. So we have seen um, a lot of data, a lot of meta-analysis, and a lot of reviews. Uh, but we have to admit that there were some limitations. Uh, although all of the studies that mentioned were mentioned ago included patients with panic disorder, they differed as to whether or not they included agoraphobic patients. So this is one limitation that should be taken into consideration. CBT also differed in the way it was provided from one study to the other uh, by different therapies in different settings, uh, and it made it difficult to compare the overall results of the studies. And uh, furthermore, there are surely methodological differences between the studies, and it is, which makes it difficult to draw clear uh, results from the uh, present results, from the present studies. So there are some future considerations, things that should be taken into consideration when uh, treating patients and when doing other research on the effectiveness of those treatments. In addition to the research data during the initial choice of treatment, we need to consider factors that can affect the choice and the outcome of the treatment. Those include the patient's preference for pharmacotherapy uh, CBT or uh, the combination of the therapy. Of course, the cost and benefit of its treatment, the patient therapy history should be taken into consideration, the of coexisting medical or, either or other psychiatric conditions, and the cost and availability of each treatment. And of course, future research should should be a more easy to predict their better response to a certain treatment or combination of treatments. So all the above should be taken into consideration. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Simo. I think we have to, to wait for the end of uh, all presentations in order to ask any questions or go on with uh, further discussion. Uh, let's invite uh, uh, Dr. Nestor Papathanasiou, and he's going to present on medication and cognitive behavior therapy for generalized anxiety disorder. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank my professor, Dr. Grigori Simons, the CBT team, and the committee for the for general general anxiety disorder. Some general information. The lifetime prevalence of GAD is approximately 12%. The 12-month prevalence of GAD ranges up to 4%. The median age of onset is approximately 30 years. Some data suggests that women may be two or three times more likely to suffer from GAD than men. The onset primary at size group and adolescence at about 50%. The mean time of existence of the problem before presenting for treatment is 25 years. 
Over 90% of individuals who met criteria for GAD have symptoms of other anxiety-related disorders and about 40 symptoms of or dysthymic disorder. Double score for women, as we can see in the diagram. 50% of the individuals with GAD satisfy the criteria of some personality disorder. The most common personality disorder associated with GAD is avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. In GAD, the risk of medical condition is also elevated, including pain syndromes, hypertension, cardiovascular, and gastric conditions. In the primary care, 60 to 90 percent of patients report painful physical symptoms. GAD is associated with functional, occupational, and quality of, of life impairments, as well as substantial economic costs. Comorbid disorders, emotional anxiety and personality disorders. About the diagnosis of GAD, before 1980, there was no GAD. With DSM-3 in 1980, it was a sub subvision of the former category of anxiety ne neurosis. The GAD diagnosis was not applied if the individual satisfied more criteria for any other disorder of axis N. With the revised DSM-3 and 4, GAD was given independent status even if the individual fulfilled the criteria for another axis I disorder. Its basic element was considered to be a prehensive expectation. In DSM-5, the diagnostic criteria are excessive anxiety and worry, occurring more days than not for at least six months about a number of events and activities. The individual finds it difficult to control the worry. The anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following six symptoms, which are restlessness or feeling it up or in the edge being easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. The anxiety, worry, or physical symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or all other important areas of functioning. The anxiety and the worry is not better explained by another mental disorder, is not attributable to psychological effects of a substance or another medical condition, and it's not better explained by another medical disorder. GAD is associated with muscle tension, somatic symptoms, exaggerated struggle response, symptoms of autonomic hyperarousal, and is frequently accompanied with irritable bowel syndrome or headaches. Few words about CBD for GAD. It is based on a model that emphasizes relationships between thoughts, emotions, and behavior. It relies on an active collaboration between clients and therapists. It aims to provide clients with tools that allow them to deal with the problem independently. It's brief and time limited, it's structured and directive, and it is based on here and now. Between sessions, exercises are an integral part of CBT. Various variables have been identified among individuals with GAD, including intolerance of uncertainty, poor problem-solving confidence, positive and negative metacognitive beliefs about the functions or the utility of worry. The therapy focuses on pathological anxiety and not only the somatic symptoms. Aim of the therapy to develop greater tolerance to uncertainty, to minimize, to minimize or diminish the irrational or exaggerated way of thinking. A complete therapy protocol includes psychoeducation and worry awareness training, recognition of intolerance to uncertainty, behavior exposure, the evaluation of the usefulness of worry, problem solving training, imaginal exposure, the evaluation of meta worries, 
mindful, mindfulness-based CBT, relaxation techniques, and relapse prevention. Some examples of manifestation of intolerance of uncertainty with approach strategies that they want to do everything themselves, looking for a lot of information, questioning and decision, looking for reassurance, overprotecting others, rechecking and doing things over and over again. And for avoiding strategies, avoiding fully committing to certain things, finding imaginary reasons for doing certain things, and procrastinating. Few words about the researches for effectiveness for CBT and GAD. A meta-analysis of MITE for CBT versus pharmacotherapy showed that CBT has better results. CBT is more effective than placebo and similarly effective to pharmacotherapy. But CBT reveals significantly lower dropout rate. A meta-analysis of HABI showed that CBT has satisfying results in the treatment of depression, panic disorder, and GAD. Another meta-analysis of HANOT showed that CBT is more effective than other psychotherapy in achieving clinical response at post-treatment and also in reducing anxiety, worry, and depression symptoms. A randomized control trial of Norton in CBT versus relaxation showed the effectiveness of two treatment methods and that found to be relative equivalent. The dropout rate was lower for CBT. A meta-analysis of Underwood <clears throat> confirmed the assumptions according to psychotherapy leads to a reliable improvement in worry and post-treatment. CBT was found to be more effective than relaxation therapy was found to be more effective than long-term methods of treatment. A meta-analysis of clippers about the effectiveness of psychotherapy generally in the treatment of GAD shows that better, res shows better results in the medical status of patients with that were submitted to CBT compared, this, compared to patients with other groups. The result of CBT was better compared to use of relaxation therapy. And CBT versus pharmacotherapy had the same results. An analysis of catchment that, the, that for, the develop, for the development of guidelines for anxiety disorders shows, showed CBT as first line psychotherapy. Some words for psychotherapy for God. There are four lines psychotherapy. In the first line, pharmacotherapy, SSRIs, escitalopram, sertraline, paroxetine, with SNRIs, duloxetine and velafaxin, other antidepressants like agomelatin and the adequalcent pregabalin. Data support that SSRIs, essential SSRIs, as the first line therapeutic intervention, the holistic effect sets it in with a latency of two to six weeks or sometimes even later. Agomelatin shows effective than placebo and as effective as italopran and precabalin is more effective than placebo and as effective as others. In the second line pharmacotherapies, benzodiazepines, the cyclic antidepressant imipranin, other antidepressants, antipsychotics and other drugs. Benzodiazepines has good effectiveness as a first line therapy but due to the 
side effects dependence and withdrawal issues is for short term use and is based on the second life therapy. QATAP was significantly superior to placebo and equivalent to antidepressants, but it is recommended as a second line option for patients due to the side effects. The same with Atarax and Bespar. As a third line pharmacotherapy, SSRIs, citalopram and fluoxetine, and other antidepressants like trazodone and mirtazapine. All of them are recommended as a third line because of limited data, side effects, or lack of clinical experience as primary therapy for treatment. Adjunctive therapy, again precabalin, demonstrated good efficiency in a large range of randomized control trials in patients with GAD. In the third line, and typical antipsychotics, like olanzapine, quetiapine, risperidone, or aripiprazole, but because of the limited evidence of efficacy and the protection of weight gain and metabolic side effects, atypical antipsychotics should be reserved for highly treatment cases of GAD. The combined CBT and pharmacotherapy, there is limited research data, there is only one meta-analysis, and there is not enough research data to support the combination for the two therapies, and more research is necessary. Finally, for pharmacotherapy, SSRIs, SNRIs, precabalin, is effective first line options in the treatment of GAD. The response rate to the therapy ranges up to 80%. The rate of recurrence prevention is high in treatment with SSRIs, SNRIs, and precabali compared to placebo. And the treatment had to be continued for 6 to 12 months after the onset of improvement. For CBT, it's effective first line option in the treatment of GAD, effective as pharmacotherapy the response rate up to 75%. The cost of the therapy is significantly low. Individual and group CBT appear to be equally effective with individual therapy to lead to earlier improvement. The CBT is superior to other psychotherapy for GAD and measures of worry and depression. CBT reduces greatly the symptoms of GAD and is more effective than the placebo or the weightless condition. The results the results for CBT are immediately observed and maintained for one to four, three years after treatment. Despite all this, effectiveness of CBT might alter according to the type and intensity of the disorder. So, when patients do not benefit from CBT, then pharmacotherapy is recommended and vice versa. The decision which therapy to be selected, CBT, pharmacotherapy or combination, should be, be, should be based on the patient's per preference, the adverse effect of medication, the latency of the effect, the severity of the disorder, the comorbidities, and the availability and the qualification of the therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Papanastasiou. Let's go on with the third presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Panagiotis Athanasis. And the title of his presentation is uh, Medication and Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Social Anxiety Disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here, Professor Simos. The committee of the Congress, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about again about the social anxiety disorder. It, this is a very important and very interesting topic, so we are going to try to find out to try to find out the, the possible therapeutic approaches that we have in order to, to help our patients deal with this very important uh, disorder. Um, first of all, we need a diagnosis, so 
we are talking about patients um, having a marked fear or anxiety about social situations. They are, when they are exposed, they think they are going to be scrutinized by others. During a social interaction, the individual fears that he or she will act in a way or show anxiety symptoms that will be negatively evaluated. Um, these social situations always provoke fear or anxiety. The social situations are avoided, the avoidance mechanisms, and the fear is out of the proportions even if the patients cannot understand that they do. Um, the fear and anxiety or avoidance are persistent, typically lasting for over six months. Um, this also cause a significant distress or impairment in many roles, not only social but also occup occupational and other important areas of functioning. And all these symptoms cannot be um, attributed to other medical conditions, other mental illnesses, mental disorders, or um, drugs, psychotropic drugs. And then due to DSM-5, we have also to, to specify if the symptoms are only, can only be seen while performances um, and restricted to speaking or performing in public. So our patients, while socially trying to socially interact, they think they're going to be scrutinized, negatively evaluated, they're going to show anxiety symptoms and the other persons that can see them, they can all also understand that they are anxious. So they're going to be scrutinized more. Um, the fear is going to be judged and it's going to be out of the proportion. I mean, they're going to be overwhelming. And this um, anxiety maybe cannot be judged as excessive because it's related to an actual danger, for instance, being bullied or tormented by others. However, those individuals often overestimate the negative consequences of social situations. Some things about the epidemiology of the disorder. Various studies have reported a lifetime prevalence ranging from 3 to 13, up to 20 percentage. <laughs> In the general population, higher rates of social anxiety disorder are found in females than in males, with odds ratios ranging from 1.5 to 2.2. In clinical settings, gender rates are equal, something that has to do with social expectations. Probably men are not supposed to be social anxious, so they seek help more often. So we see more males than females. The median age of onset is 13 years. Sometimes we see our patients only if there are adults, and some, some of them after a stressful or humiliating event or after life changes that require new social roles. For, some, for instance, somebody is marrying someone for a different social class or receives a job promotion. And the detection of the disorder of our patients is also can be very difficult. Some of our patients come complaining only about somatic symptoms or great avoidance strategies. That means that don't do, they don't socially interact, and that's very important to ask more to see if they're, they, it's, it's obscured um, impairment of the social life. It's the physicians also have problems recognizing this disorder. 0.5 percentage, even less, as studies can tell us. Uh, some things about the development and the course of the disorder. In the community, approximately 30 percentage of our patients do remit within a year, and about 50 percentage experience remission within, within a few years. 60 percentage of them, without a specific treatment for social anxiety disorder, the course takes several years or longer. We have some problems about, differentiate, about the differential diagnosis for our patients. 
Not all of them, they seem shy, they, they seem that they have some problems during the social interactions, but some of them um, are just shy. Some, some of them are obsessive, focusing on the physical appearance. Uh, some of them have difficulties adjusting behavior to suit some social contexts, like the autistic ones. And some of them are schizophrenic, suffer from schizophrenia and the negative symptomatic. We have to not to forget that many of our patients suffer from many other mental illnesses, except from social anxiety disorder. There are overlaps. We have to don't forget that the they avoidant personality disorder is more than eight, uh, 60 percentage of them. So, and it, I think it's more than 80 percentage of our patients have any mental illness, except from social anxiety disorder. So what we can do, uh, among other uh, psychological approaches, it's this uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and the cognitive behavioral therapy is probably the most well-known and the most practiced form of modern psychotherapy. CBT has been integrated into highly structured packages, so-called protocols, for the treatment of patients suffering from social phobia. There are many protocols. I don't think that this presentation is about them and how CBT deals with those patients, but we, are, we can um, tell the conventional ones that may started also CBT. Um, and then also the disorder-specific CPT models that came afterwards um, that actually um, have some specific uh, approaches using exposure techniques, fine cognitive restructuring therapy, and also social skill training. Let's say that somebody is trying to talk to people. He thinks that he will be scrutinized by them. And then he gets anxious. He sweats. He fears that the others will find out that he's nervous. He avoids starting a conversation that makes things worse. And the vicious circles has already started. That's also a simplified model of social anxiety disorder. But it's something that we use in order to understand the patient, the patient, the patient, the way that the patient feels, and this is also among others in handouts. Um, first of all, we have to understand the patient means the way he, the way the patient feels and thinks. It's very important about the high perceived social standards, the poorly defined social skills, the heightened self-focused attention. He thinks that he perceives himself like in a negative way, high estimated social cost, low perceived emotional control, perceived poor social skill. He avoids, he avoids social, in, to, social interaction and after the event he ruminates. So what we do is that we were trying to, to discuss about the perceived expectations of others to evaluate, to help me, him evaluate the social encounter as either successful or unsuccessful, regardless of the subjective anxiety encountered in the situations. We try to encourage, encourage him to direct his attention towards the situation. We also use video feedbacks in order to enhance the self-perception. We are trying to, to help him create social mishaps to observe the consequences. The perception of emotional control may be targeted by creating a state of dissonance between the individual's perception of their own autonomic arousal and an outsider's perspective by watching video recordings of their speeches. The safety behaviors are also very important to be targeted through repeated and continuous exposure to fearful social situations while eliminating any safety behavior. Regarding the post-event rumination, it can be targeted by helping patients process negative social events more adaptively through guided questions. 
For example, how will your life change as a result of a particular social mishap? We know that CBT works. That means that there are many um, studies about the efficacy on social anxiety disorder versus waiting list versus placebo. These therapeutic results are, can also be observed in follow evaluations up to 60 months later. The meta-analysis are also compatible, not only versus placebo, but also versus waiting list. The severe patients, the patients that suffer from social anxiety disorder in a severe way, there are some studies that uh, say that there is statistically seen it's not um, different than placebo. So probably we have to find something else to adjunct or uh, like as an add-on therapy, for instance, medication as we will see later. So the effects could be compared to a waiting list placebo or treatment as usual. Treatment as usual is defined as, as a, a clinical setting would normally offer to those patients. Cognitive behavioral treatments seem to have a moderate but significant effect in the treatment of this disorder compared to control. As you can tell here, the effect sizes in those meta-analyses are between zero and one. So the, the mean, the medium in range is between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. The guidelines, we try to find the actual guidelines, not only in Europe, but uh, worldwide. The British ones, the Canadian ones, the German ones, the Swiss ones, and the World, the World Federation of Societies in Biological Psychiatry. It's interesting that everybody suggests CBT. I think it's a little bit, we can, we, we can tell that um, CBT can help and these guidelines are compatible with that. And they suggest all of them, individual and group CBT. They, it, it seems that individual is better than group, but group CBT, it seems that it can reduce the cost. So in the middle of financial crisis, probably is a good solution. It offers better role plays. It is very, it's a very good example of social skill training. The patient see also other people, can watch other people doing and trying to cope with the same problems. And that is also very good for the self-efficacy. Of course, there are, there are other approaches mentioned. Among them is also the psychodynamic approach. So they suggest that they, if the, the patient wants it, the patient's conven is convenience, if there are some com comorbidities to be seen, for instance, avoidant personality disorder, or if the, pa if the patient does not respond to CBT, we have to find out something else. What about the medication on social anxiety disorder? We know that we have some effective solutions. SSRI seem to be the first line in this, the first line of, of our approach. It, not all, all uh, SSRI uh, compounds are the same and do have the same effectiveness. For instance, we know that the citalopram, paroxetine, and sertraline do, they are effective. That's why they are also on label for social anxiety disorder. But on the other side, fluvoxamine, fluoxetine, citalopram, citalopram seem not to be so effective. That also can be seen in the guidelines. The Canadians tell us that uh, paroxetine, sertraline, and fluvoxamine are also, uh, they are in the first line. The British also, the, I mean, the British um, tell us just to, that there is no difference between the SSRI compounds, so any SSRI could suit us, but we have to wait longer than eight weeks. The World Federation prefers acetalopram, fluvoxamine, paroxetine, and sertraline, and they define citalopram and fluoxetine as problematic, as the Germans, 
prefer paroxetine, sertraline, or citalopram. And they mentioned that citalopram, fluoxetine, and fluvoxamine are off-label. That means that we cannot find this indication on their SPC. Um, a little bit about SNRIs. I'm mentioning here only venlafaxine, but also duloxetine would be a great uh, approach. Uh, the there, is, there are some meta-analysis proven about SS SNRIs, and they are, have proven effectiveness. Uh, the Canadians in, in other guidelines tell us that we, we, we can um, try to, to cope with those problems of our patients with venlafaxine, but keep in mind that a dual mechanism has also a double side effect. I mentioned here moclobemide. This is a reversible inhibitor of monoamine oxidase. So I mentioned it here because it's a, it's a very cheap solution for Greece that we, we can, we can um, give it, prescribe it to our patients. Uh, Meta-analysis meta say that it is okay, but uh, the effectiveness and the efficacy is not as much as SSRI. Um, second line, some of them say that this is third line. Um, so it's acceptable, but not a license indication. As far as side effects are, is concerned, are exceptionally low with insomnia, headache, and dizziness being the most commonly reported in the initial stage of therapy. Pregambaline is also another option. It seems to be effective in some, or many actually, random con control trials, but only in high doses. That means more than 600 milligrams per day. But keep in mind that it's, it's an off-label compound. The um, buspiron is also another option. Seems to be not effective in many RCTs but it's a great solution for adjunctive therapy, helping SSRIs being more effective, but never or not a um, choice for monotherapy. Benzodiazepines, of course, we know that we have to, to keep in mind that can offer a very, um, to help our patient deal with that um, symptoms, but only for a short period. NICE tells us only per need. We have to keep in mind the side effects that are, of course, that makes patient dependent, tolerant, and somnolent. The Germans say that we have to use it only with precaution and only with patients with cardiovascular problems, the patients that suffer from suicidal ideas and have to be exposed in the early stages of treatment. For instance, somebody wants to fly and he's not capable of that yet. And there are some compounds. This is a big, it's a huge topic nowadays that there are some compounds being able to enhance CBT. I'm trying to mention two of them today. The first one would be an NMDA agonist that seems to be a cognitive enhancer during extinction learning and expose therapy. That means that the, during the social interaction, or actually after that, because as we say, the post-event rumination is a very important topic about our patients, he, he, the, the, these compounds help them deal with that uh, thought, so the next time they don't avoid this social interaction as they used to. Some, some RCTs say that it's effective, some of them do not, so the guidelines, there, are no, there is no recommendation for NMDA agonists, if I can say maybe yet, but we have to, to find out that it's not so simple to say, okay, everybody that is in non CBT exposure tra um, therapy, that we can use that compound. It seems that it has, it is effective to patients that only after exposures in which and fear levels are low, as this uh, kiclosherine can make good exposures even better, but bad exposures worse. Some animal studies suggest that
Compound of fear. The last compound that I want to mention today is the oxytocin, that it is also a very huge topic nowadays. Oxytocin, there are some evidence that it is, that it is a, um, an important role for the system that has to deal with social interaction, general anxiety and social fear. It seems that they can reduce stress-induced cortisol responses and decreases amygdala activity, interfering with a hypothalamic neurohypophysial system. That seems to be very complicated, but the thing is that it is, it is a part of the so-called social brain. I mean, the brain that has to deal with social interaction, and oxytocin is there, among other compounds, as we can tell, in order to some some areas of this brain to in order to be uh, activated so we i think uh, it, there are some evidence that we use oxytocin while socially interfering with others so our patients that have so many problems about social anxiety and social interfering seems to be a very promising uh, compound some years now, there is an intranasal administration of oxytocin, the effort, off-label, of course. That means that they are trying to enhance this social interaction and reduce social anxiety. But the analysis of that is a little bit too early to understand if we can rely on that compound. To make a pretty long story short is that except from the very good um, described responses to a, to a fearful event. For instance, let's say that we, um, we can see a bear or a fearful event that um, provokes fear to us. Uh, except from fight flight and rest digest response, uh, there is also another response that it is called the tent befriend response. Let's say that out of the blue we confront a bear, something that can provoke fear. We will enter then the so-called fight flight response. And when the bear or we are gone, we will rest using the rest digest mode. So the thing is that except from that re two responses, there is also another response that seems to be very important for the social interactions. For instance, as we see here in this figure, if these small fishes cannot fight or flee away from that big fish, why don't they tend? Tend mean like to tend to each other and befriend in, to each other in order to defend themselves properly. For that response, it seems that we use oxytocin, so these fishes are not, as you can tell, socially anxious. As I said, this is a very beginning of something, so we have to wait a little bit in, to find out which is the, the role of oxytocin in, our, in all this uh, situation and the social interfering, social anxiety, and so on. Um, CBT approaches keep their good results. They have less dropout. So, we, ha we have to, 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 to find the, the, the patients, the real, the, the, to find out which patients we have to, f to offer CBT and which ones we are going to offer the medication. So drugs would be also a very interesting approach, but keep in, keep in mind that there are some side effects. The follow-ups are better in combination CBT and drug than CBT and placebo. But on the other hand, Davidson found no benefit of adding fluoxetine SSRI to CBT, whereas Blomhoff suggested the possible advantage of combined sexually in behavior therapy relative to behavior treatment alone. A combined treatment may be more effective than pharmacotherapy in social anxiety disorder. It is very difficult to find differences and to compare between a drug and a psychological approach. So all this meta-analysis and random control trials, uh, I think that statistically seen are a little bit too complex to find out, to, 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 
to get a, a clean and a clear suggestion which approach is better. But as we can see in the meta-analysis here, the bundle law 2015, we see that the best approach, I mean, as far as effect size is concerned, is our SNRIs. Bendoziapines is also a good uh, combination, SSRI, TCAs, but as you can see here, CBT and drug is also very high. I mean, the effect size is very big in comparison to the other ones. Um, an interesting meta-analysis comes from Lancet Psychiatry. As you can probably not see, <laughs> is that uh, there are many uh, studies about which approach is better. As you can see, this is this with black letters combined CBT. There are not so many studies in comparison to other um, approaches. So as you, as my my idea is that it's a little bit too difficult to understand if the drugs can be um, seen as an, an as an another. A opportunity for our patients. But the, the Lancet, as you can tell here, is like that the, the combination of CBT with drugs have a better um, effect size than CBT, individual CBT, and drug alone. So that can also be seen in, gui in guidelines. The British and the Canadian preferred drugs, they have less relapses, but there are limited data. The World Federation thinks that the combination is better than drug by himself. The Canadian think that CBT is equal with SSRI and other drugs, but also there are limited data. The Germans say that there are faster results to be seen in combined CBT, so why don't you offer both? But keep in mind to adjust the treatment according to the patient needs. Inform him, for instance, about treatment duration, relapses, side effects, and costs. And if there is no response, try another combination. Most patients nowadays receive either pharmacotherapy or drugs, and only a minority receives combined therapy, but the combined treatment has to be given to severe and chronic cases. Of course, there are many limitations, as I said. There is a difference between efficacy and effic effectiveness, so if a, a treatment works, that doesn't seem that it, patients can benefit from that, the psychotherapy needs time, so we cannot compare something that needs two or five or six weeks with something that needs probably more months. The other thing is that we compare our approaches to different things. I mean, the second arm is like placebo, psychological placebo, wait list, treatment as usual, that are a little bit difficult to define. And the, the samples, our samples, the samples of RC, RCTs and uh, meta-analysis are very inhomogeneous, heterogeneous. So the, stati the statistical problem is there. There is also the so-called fight drawer problem. I mean, this is the publication bias. If the, if the N, I mean, if the number of our patients are small, Probably the uh, studies are not published, or if the, neg if the results are negative, or the, the results are not to be seen. So we have to keep in mind if we read constantly about approaches that do work. And what about the diagnosis? Is it right? Is the patient that has not only social anxiety disorder, but also some other problems that some, in some RCTs are not included, for instance, avoidant personality disorder or psychotropic drugs. So CBT should be regarded as the best intervention for the initial treatment of social anxiety disorder. In part of response, adding medication seems to be a reasonable choice. For individuals who decline psychological interventions, SSRIs show, show the most consi consistent evidence of benefit. 
Medications have side effects, interactions and contradictions. So we have to keep in mind the costs and duration of treatment. So before starting with an approach and a therapy, we have to agree a choice based on therapy effectiveness and cost-benefit ratio. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Athanasis. I think uh, we have seen quite a lot of data and quite a lot of uh, research evidence either uh, favoring uh, CBT or favoring uh, medication. We have seen all those data favoring the combination of two. I think it's, it's very difficult to, to get only one, one uh, uh, solution for all problems. So we have to, to be a little bit critical and try to see what's the best for each individual patient. I think we have 10 uh, minutes if we want to uh, discuss, uh, ask questions, and go on with this. It seems that everything was very, very, very clear or very, very, very unclear. So shall we vote? Was that clear? Okay. <laughs> was that unclear? No, okay. Uh, do you have something to add, a comment to make? Okay, I, th I think that um, maybe we are a little bit biased. I mean, uh, I'm a CBT practitioner from being also a, a, a psychiatrist. Uh, both Athanasis and uh, Nestoras are uh, psychiatrists too. Uh, Merope Simu is a psychologist, but she's a minority anyway. <laughs> Not because she's a female, but uh, <laughs> because we are so many psychiatrists around. Um, but but th I think there is compelling evidence that uh, probably uh, CBT is very effective. Um, there is a question, I think, that for the time being uh, we cannot uh, answer in a very concrete and precise way. That is, uh, is the combination of CBT plus medication better than uh, only uh, medication or only CBT? Um, there are contrasting evidence, evidences. Uh, sometimes it seems, it seems that um, combination is no better than either treatment alone, and especially uh, CBT. But concerning CBT, uh, there is always a question, I mean, uh, if there is so much demand on the one hand, do we have so many CBT therapies to provide CBT in those patients who need that? I think that we don't have so many CBT, well-trained well CBT practitioners in order to face all those uh, challenges uh, of anxiety disorders. I guess too that you are almost all familiar with the IAPT program in the UK, the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. Uh, British people are uh, very methodical. Uh, sometimes I'm jealous of them. They, they actually get to the point when they said, okay, we have a CBT thing that's effective, and we have quite a lot of people around the UK who are suffering from anxiety disorders, so why don't we train 6,000 practitioners in order to, to, to send them to all uh, mental health centers or hospitals or, or whatever or other uh, facilities, and um, in order to give uh, the British people uh, the advantage of uh, having uh, available CBT for their anxiety disorders, um, some thousands of people have already uh, made, have completed their treatment. There are good results. Um, some thousands of uh, people uh, have uh, left... Uh, um, uh, ah. I can't really find the way. Uh, their, their benefits, I mean, they have to, to give up their benefits and go uh, back and to work. Uh, so it seems that um, 
the UK is uh, actually using CBT in uh, the best uh, possible and profitable way. Uh, okay, it's me speaking again. Any questions? Okay. But you don't want us to to leave. We have some a couple, a couple of more minutes. <laughs> Four minutes. Okay. I will introduce a controversy. I actually believe that after 35 uh, years of uh, clinical experience that probably social anxiety disorder is not an actual anxiety disorder. I think it's for me it's more than a personality disorder. I imagine that uh, some years from now, in DSM-15, let's say, there will be a uh, uh, social anxiety personality disorder. Uh, because it seems that social anxiety is something that one has it or has it not. And I also uh, believe the same with uh, generalized anxiety disorder. I think that uh, patients with generalized anxiety disorder suffer for ages. Uh, it is something that is there uh, just beneath their skin. And uh, I also believe that in some years from now, maybe we are going to have another personality disorder, the generalized anxiety personality disorder. So that means that uh, maybe diagnostically it will be more precise but on the other hand, um, it will be even more difficult to treat a personality disorder with medication. Anyway, this is uh, science fiction anyway. So, thank you very much for coming.
Αυτό δεν είναι δυνατό. Το φως. Όπως σας έλεγα νωρίτερα... Ευχαριστώ.
prevent action, physical or artificial activity which threatens straightforward the organization, structure, structure and welfare of the society with local, national or international impact with short-term but long-term results as well. We shall, we shall focus on the main characteristics of a crisis so as to be able to comprehend it and other times solve it for the common good. The most important fe uh, features of crisis are the fact that it, it is scaling, uh, scaling in intense, the high sense of insecurity and danger, the normal operations are being influenced, the danger to damage the public image of the organization, and finally, a crisis ends up to control by public authorities and media. Anyway, there are four timely stages in a crisis so as to reach the final stage of rehabilitation where the incident has already affected the people. The forerunner stage, secondly, the stage of evaluation and progress, the stage of the de strengthening of and of long-term impact and the final stage of rehabilitation. Even more uh, significant is the way we achieve to overcome any crisis, so their management is crucial. So, what is crisis management? Of course, it is not sitting down asking what to do. Definitely, it is the opposite. Let me show you. Management is the sum, the, the sum of of activities which include the, the timely schedule and preparation, the ident identification of a crisis, its confrontation and its resolution. Crisis management constitutes a strategic planning process with the aim to get rid part of the, dan the danger and uh, insecurity, which will allow the organization to manage the evolution of the, ev of the event. The stages of crisis management are prevention, alertness, response, and rehabilitation. The communication crisis management is very important if we want to avoid big crises and maybe suffer more from effects. So, crisis management is the crisis end of public before, during, an important impact to the formation of negative behaviors. Another psychological effect is the attribution of responsibility in emotions of rage and anger to the public. And finally, the maintenance of those emotions that can lead to a permanent alteration in public's behavior. This sort of behavior may lead to some disorders affecting the, the life of, of any person. Some of them are special adjustment disorder, intense reaction to stress, post-traumatic st stress disorder, and non-special organic psychic disorder, chosen mourn, depression, generalized disorder of an anxiety, panic disorder, use of substances. Such psychiatric disorders may be visible, especially to more sensitive parts of the society, such as children, injured persons, people having lost their dear persons, persons with previous psychiatric disorder rescuers, health professionals, uh, health professionals, staff for the management of dead rescuers, and persons exposed to numerous of devast devastating deaths. The size of psychiatric sickness depends on the type of disaster, level of life threat, the tension of the tra this traumatic event, duration of social uh, this organization. Let's see now communication crisis management from the manager side and the effect of the transferred message on the psychology, psychology of common goals. The most power, powerful mean of communication is very, in, in every crisis is the mass media, which uh, is the mass media which can either transmit the news very fast or create a constructive reality or even cause panic. In any way, mass, me me mass media should be taken care and their role needs to be restricted in cases like that so as to avoid extreme behaviors and legal actions. 
For instance, take into consideration the images of this boy and how scared he is. Name one person who would not be shocked and angry when looking at this picture. So, mass media create a psycho-pressing condition. This psycho-pressing condition maximizes in the recipient when the picture comes from a well-known and valid magazine as the Times. While the articles are in Greek, this is an, oh, excuse me. Okay. Do you like after the better? So no, excuse me. Είναι το ΜΑΚ και δεν μπορώ να το... Okay. Okay. Δεν μπορούσα να το πιάσω γιατί είναι υπηρετικό τέτοιο. While, while the articles are in Greek, this is an, an indicative example of constructive reality of mass media that happened when the grand opening of Acropolis Museum took place on Saturday, 20th of June, 2009. In Greece, Sunday newspapers are being printed in two editions, one early in the morning of Saturday and the second one on Saturday evening, despite the fact that they go on circulation on Sunday, distributed at the points of, of sale on Saturday night. So, the president of Turkey was to to be present in the grand opening of Acropolis Museum, but early in the morning that day, he postponed his visit, so he did not come to the opening. However, the first edition of the newspapers was in the printing procedure, resulting in having printed in the first edition, the presence of Turkish, Turkish president at there uh, was also an extensive report concerning the meeting of the President of Turkey and the Prime Minister of Greece, which never actually happened. In the slide you can see, you can see the first and the second edition of this, of this by the most valid newspaper in Greece called the uh, Tovima. It is of great importance to tell you that this news was never disproven in the printed edition, but there was only an apology displayed it in the electronic page of the newspaper for only 15 minutes. Minima minimizing the powering of media, we have to address some success successful ways, for example, the, the existence of a suitable team of communication crisis management, written plan of communication crisis management, communication scheme with the media before the, before they ha them having to communi communicate with us, press representative selection and preparation, communication network between the state services and organization who are involved in communication management. Concerning the procedure of communication and crisis management, first of all, we need to find the answers to all these questions in an attempt to evaluate the situation and its seriousness. What happened exactly? What caused the, this emergency? What is the, the response? Who are involved in, this, in, the, in the crisis? Where did it happen exactly? How did it happen exactly? When did it happen? What is its size? Was there, was there coverage, by, coverage by the media? What is the, what is the reaction of the public? There are many things to consider if we want to restrict the damage of misleading information to the public. First of all, giving importance to the validity of information, ensuring the simplification of, of information and share only what happened exactly, checking information and awareness, operating the coherence and continu continuously with the evolution of the, of the event, coordinating the allocation of information to the organization involved, 
creating only a channel of communication. Communication should affect only in positive ways. Leaving aside public opinion and the population which may have been hit by such crises is totally wrong. So we have to focus our efforts on their race owners while listening to them and taking into account their feelings and fears. Let's see now how the media are being perceived by organization. The successful crisis management is based on the, on the, on the fact that there is already a professional channel of information that has been put into action in the, in the, in the past. That means that the, that the organization who has to handle the crisis has at its disposal a service position which he has to translate into communi communicational level as well. However, it mainly means that the organization already follows an informative policy which comes from its structure and its sim uh, similarity with certain forms of actions within the society, its, opera its operation and structure of this country. The highest expectation which comes from the above idea is that the organization is required to fulfill its role. For this expect expectation to become true, all those aspects should be Im Im uh, implemented that compose the image of the organization. So the role of the media and of organizations involved is to reassure people that they are doing the best they can in order to keep them calm is awkward situation. Relationship of trust are built when with the messages we communicate, we transmit, like professionalism, ability and speciality, honesty, clearance, repetition, dedication and uh, commitment, commitment, sympathy, understanding, caring, speed of reaction and effectiveness. Uh, shooting public opinion it's, uh, is achieved by announcing the clear roles and obligations by services planning, by recognizing the fears of public and its agony concerning its reaction of this occurring situation by transmitting certain messages that show the alertness of the organization or the state. It's also achieved with the, with the a transmission of messages that express interest, sympathy, responsibility, collaboration spirit and determination. In order for any message to, re to reach its recipient it is vital to have the following characteristics. Be short, be simple and understandable for, by everyone. Communicate with three messages at the top. Same message to be repeated concerning the context and texture. There are some expressions and phrases that manage to keep people calm and reassure them that everything will be all right in the, in the end. Such messages are, we are working hard so as to limit negative impact by using every possible mean. Another message of interest and sympathy is, I have already given instructions to the emergency team so as to proceed to any activity necessary so as for the people to return safety to their homes the soonest possible. In cases of crisis, an important problem that should be faced in this, uh, the spreading of rumors Rumors will damage the final outcome concerning the resolution of the crisis. Actions for speedy conf confrontation of an uh, ongoing rumor that we are not aware of its validity. Isolating the source of rumor as soon as possible. Judging the, by each case, we contact the media and remind them that information is just rumor and it has to be confirmed as or misconfirmed, being honest while simultaneously we avoid giving answers with uh, assertion minimizing the danger of being exposed dra dramatically. Summarizing, communication management in a crisis ensures rapid, coordinated, proven, focused and targeted reaction. 
Preparation and planning is required instead of just reacting. Prevention instead, prevention instead of late intervention. In high percent, uh, percentage success in a communication crisis is valued by the immediate response in the beginning, immediately when it happens, and before it spreads out. Com finally, communication crisis management is an ongoing process which requires flexible managerial policy, is complex and requires method methodology, requires multi-level approach, requ requires inter-scientific cooperation, requires inter-operation. Henry Kissinger said to us that no crisis can happen next week as my schedule is full. It is definitely certain that uh, what really st stands is what my professor Dutch Leonard uh, in Harvard Kennedy School of Government said during the execu executive education leadership in crisis preparation and performance when we had just finished an exercise, exercise on map of communication crisis management. It's over. Take a short time to enjoy your crisis free moment and the, then begin preparing for the next one because unfortunately there is always a next one. When the next one does arrive, you will, you will better prepared and have even more knowledge to deal with the situation. From all the above that we have mentioned so far, it's, it is totally understood how important and necessary is the role of the psychiatrist and his presence and participation in planning and comforting disaster crises in headquarters for crisis management and in education in the community. Further, of great, uh, of great importance is the consula uh, con, uh, consultation in all medical specialties and the diagnosis and confrontation of psychiatric disorders. All parties requested to manage crisis and emergency situations needs to be well prepared and be able to control their feelings because if we do not manage our feelings in a crisis correctly, we will not be able to manage the crisis properly and effectively. Thank you for your attention and your patience. Thank you, George. And we are going to uh, continue with our second speaker, which is Dr. Achilles Ikonomou, who will speak on the impact of disasters on mental health and evidence of, from our current experience. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you for being here in the symposium organized by the Greek sector of uh, the psychiatric, uh, Greek, the young psychiatry sector of the Hellenic Psychiatric Association. Before starting my presentation, I would like to thank Professor Fudulakis for his gentle and most of all honorable invitation to take part in one of the most important European conferences. In order to define the term disaster and its connection with health generally, uh, we will use once again the World Health Organization, which says that disaster is an occurring disruption of the normal conditions of existence and causing a level of suffering that the affected community. We have three different kinds of disasters. First of all, the natural disasters, like earthquakes, droughts, floods, cyclones, tsunamis, Landslide is the disaster in my own village. We have lost a house uh, from this. Uh, volcanic eruptions and extreme temperature conditions. The second kind is the human-made or man-made disasters, like war, conflict conditions or situations in a country, immigration, uh, refugee waves, uh, nuclear accidents, chemical explosions, environmental pollution, fire forests, terrorism, and some kinds of accidents like rail, airplane, and ship accidents, 
And the third kind of disaster is the financial or economic disaster, such as a complete breakdown of national, regional, and territorial uh, economy, a personal economic disaster, and the unemployment. Speaking generally, what are the main impacts or consequences of disasters? According to the Indian reader Sharma, whose country has an enormous experience of all kinds of disasters, the impacts are the following. One characteristics, characteristics of the ongoing uh, economical uh, disaster, I don't know exactly what, what it is, and made uh, disasters concerning our country and our neighbor. Initially, let's see some data about natural disasters generally. The majority of people affected or killed by natural disasters reside in developing countries. 96% of them, of uh, people killed and uh, almost all of the affected people were in Asia and Pacific region, in Latin America, in Caribbean and in Africa. The most common natural disasters in Greece are earthquakes, extreme temperature conditions, storms and flooding, and wild affected in, uh, by all these disasters in a period of 115 years, we had uh, about uh, dead people, one million affected people, like injured, homeless, requiring immediate assistance, displaced, and... A question especially to our friends from abroad. abroad. Which, in your opinion, is the most damaging and devastating disaster in Greece throughout the ages? Daria? Uh, Thessaloniki is not uh, abroad. <laughs> is the earthquake. The countries with the greatest earthquake occurrence and consequences uh, from 1980 to, to 2009 are China, Indonesia, Iran, Turkey, Japan, Afghanistan, United States of America, Peru, Greece, and uh, Pakistan. Comparing Greece with, to other countries like Pakistan, Peru, and Afghanistan with similar numbers of earthquakes, we can, we can see that we have an extraordinary small number of killed or affected people. Probably the explanation uh, of this is the high quality of our buildings. So if you feel the earth moving here, don't be afraid. Probably the building will protect us. I hope so. Now let's see the five most serious and devastating earthquakes in Greece from 1950 until today. The first was in Zagithos in Kefalonia with uh, about uh, 500 uh, dead people. The second in Thessaloniki in 1978 with uh, uh, fifth, uh, in Aegean in Peloponnes uh, 1999 with uh, 152 deaths. The impact of wakes in, men uh, in mental health is acute stress reactions, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, depression and substance use disorders. And all of these uh, disorders lead to last for years following the earthquake. Let's see some data about PTSD from the newest evidence. The study by Colaitis showed that uh, PTSD may be observed in uh, 32 to 80 uh, percent of uh, the adult and in the 26 to 95 percent of the population following an earthquake. The study by FOE, PTSD coexists with one or more mental disorders and with poorer physical health. Bonanno says that the rates of PTSD appear to be much higher in developing countries. This study by Kilic uh, uh, concerning the big earthquake in Turkey in 1999, very close chronically to the earthquake of Athens, showed that uh, four years after the disaster, the PTSD rate was 25% and the depression rate 11%. The predictors of PTSD were the intensity of fear during the earthquake, the previous exposure to traumatic events, the female gender, the younger age, and the loss of kin. 
The majority of studies in Greece concerning earthquakes were conducted in relation with the earthquake of 1999 in Athens. One of the most important of these studies is the following by Professor Christodoulou, which found that uh, the acute stress reaction was about uh, uh, 85%. 30% of them had uh, mild reaction, 30% uh, moderate reaction, and again 30% uh, severe reaction. PTSD The rate of PTSD was uh, 43%. Almost all subjects with PTSD suffered by acute st stress reaction initially, and the acute stress re reaction was the only predictor for PTSD. In this study by Livanou, a substantial proportion experienced symptoms of PTSD and depression, 22% moderate or severe subjective distress, and 15% in difference with social, occupational, and personal adjustment due to their symptoms. Two main conclusions were pointed out by this study. The first was that the intensity of fear during the earthquake and the participation in rescue operations were related to greater psychopathological distress. And the second, that earthquakes can lead to long-lasting psychological effects to some survivors. Uh, the characteristic of another study by Russos. Uh, it uh, was a school-based study three months after the earthquake in two, di in two different cities of Athens, the first in the epicenter of uh, the earthquake, the other 10 kilometers away. And uh, uh, the, PTSD rate, the PTSD rates was about 5%, the pressure rates 14%, and mainly boys reported having vengeful thoughts after the earthquake. Uh, this is a study about, a uh, retrospective study about the earthquake of uh, Kefalonia. Uh, the main characteristic uh, is that um, uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, lot, some uh, people of the sample, experienced intense recollection of event at the anniversaries of uh, the earthquake. Now, let's move to another crucial issue, the impact of economic crisis in mental health. In order to reach some useful conclusions, we'll use the last year's paper of the European Psychiatric uh, Association Guidance of Mental Health and Economic Crisis in Europe. From 2007 to 2014, 17 studies were conducted about the consequences of financial crisis in psychiatric morbidity in different countries like United Kingdom, uh, like Sweden, uh, Greece, Finland, uh, Portugal, Spain, and uh, Italy. We have three different uh, uh, studies from Greece, uh, and uh, uh, three of them uh, have to do with uh, uh, increased depression and anxiety rates. In this slide, we can see the alcohol abuse uh, and uh, the addictive behaviors in the economic uh, crisis. Uh, one study of Italy showed decrease uh, uh, of uh, uh, decrease of the expensive uh, alcohol uh, drinks uh, and uh, increase of the uh, cheaper uh, of them. Uh, and uh, a study including uh, 23 European countries showed an overall decrease of alcohol consumption and uh, mortality due to liver diseases. In my opinion, one of the most sensitive issues about the financial disasters is the possibility of the increase of the suicidal behaviors. In the following study, we can see 21 different studies of some European countries. I won't discuss the results of the studies because we have here the man who knows better than everyone. If the connection between economic disasters and the increase of the suicidal behavior exists, and I would like to listen to your opinion, Professor Fudlakis. Uh, but le let me say something from my experience. If you go outside here in Greece 
to ask people what is happening with the suicides increased the last five years, they will tell you for sure that we have an enormous number of dead people. Three, three years ago, I made a presentation in a local health center in my, near to my hometown. And uh, one of the doctors, doctors of the health center asked me about the connection of the suicidal uh, uh, behaviors and the economic crisis. I answered that the evidence is much different of, of what it said in the community. The comment of the director of the health center was that I don't, uh, that I, I probably don't live in Greece, I don't live in this universe generally. Uh, so this is why I do want your opinion, professor, and because I want to know where exactly I live. The mass dimension of the impact of the disasters in uh, mental health is the crisis of the immigration and the refugee waves. But when, speak, uh, about, uh, when we speak about uh, migration, we mean the involuntary Asian women born in Asia likely to have psychiatric disorders than those born in the United States. Second generation Asian American women were at higher risk than the first generation. And Asian American men, knowledgeable in English, had lower rates of psychiatric disorders. This study about the Hispanic American immigrants showed that they had lower rates of substance use disorders and overall psychiatric disorders. But both third, fourth, uh, uh, second and third generation had higher rates of psychiatric disorders. Proficient in English and by culturally adapted people had higher rates of psychiatric disorders. And this is the increase the family cultural were associated with increased risk of depressive and anxiety. Immigrants compared to immigrants had lower lifetime risks of psychiatric disorders, but this, uh, this risk was related to the age at immigration and the duration of residence in the United States. Both early age of immigration and the duration of living in the United States contribute to increased risk as the attempt to resolve the acculturative stress. Here we have two different studies about the Mexican immigrants in the United States. The first study showed that uh, lifetime prevalence of psychiatric disorders was lowest among immigrants residing one to 12 years in the United States. The highest rates uh, was about immigrants who have been living in the United States more than 13 years. We have to do with the healthy immigrant hypothesis. According to this hypothesis, selective migration of people with good mental health uh, and this advantage reserves with the time, possibly as a consequence of the acculturative stress. In the second study, immigrants had significant lifetime prevalence of mood and anxiety disorders. Pre-existing anxiety disorders predicted immigration and they had an elevated risk among immigrants who came to the United States as children. We can see that the results were inconsistent with the healthy immigrant hypothesis, and we have a new hypothesis that the findings were partially consistent with the acculturative stress hypothesis. In Australia, there if you want to immigrate in Australia, you can see the results, probably. Uh, they have lower rates of psychiatric disorders among immigrants compared to Australian-born subjects, Non-English speaking had lower rates than those born in English speaking countries. Now we have to do with the healthy immigrant effect. Mentally healthy immigrants are more likely to be accepted, likely to immigrate. In England, compared to white born subjects, Indian and Pakistani women had significantly higher rates of common mental disorders. In Israel, Immigrants from the former Soviet Union had higher rates of mental disorders compared to Israeli-born individuals. We have to do with the immigration morbidity hypothesis. Immigration is associated with acculturative stress that generates psychopathological distress. 
some words about the refugees in Australia. In a sample of uh, 1,161 uh, 1, Vietnamese refugees resettled in Australia for 11 years, and uh, a sample of about 8,000 uh, Australian-born inhabitants. Lifetime diagnosis of any mental disorder for, for Vietnamese, 50 percent, and for Australian-born uh, subjects, 19 percent. In the United States of America, pre-immigration trauma was a significant factor in predicting psychopathological distress even five years after immigration to the United States. Cambodian immigrants had high rates of PTSD and major depression. Uh, this slide is one of my lovely slides. It is a study by Faris and Tanhan. Uh, was conducted a lot of years ago in uh, uh, Chicago in uh, from 1982 to 1934 in uh, uh, four different uh, hospitals and uh, eight private sanatoriums in Chicago. And I like a lot this uh, slide of the study because it shows the sensitivity generally of psychiatry in a huge fields of interest like the immigration in the early ages. The main uh, conclusion of this study was that schizophrenia has higher morbidity rates in immigrants compared to the native population. Uh, this is a, recommenda a recommendation if you uh, want to find the newest data or uh, uh, a lot of uh, studies about disasters and the impact of them in mental health is the new book by Professor Christodoulou. Uh, John Rockefeller used to say that I always tried to turn every disaster into an opportunity. The Dalai Lama says that if we lose our hope, that's our real disaster. And with this words of wisdom, thank you for patience and your attention. Thank you, Dr. Economou. And we will uh, uh, proceed with uh, the third speech, which is on mental health and child and adolescent uh, refugees by uh, Irini Rera. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm glad being here. In this presentation, I would like to focus on the subject of mental health of child and adolescent refugees. I will do my best not to go over time. The previous year, thank you. The previous year, young people aged five to 13 were invited to compose an original work of fiction on any subject or theme. Um, the word which was chosen after analyzing over 2,500 words on a BBC competition was the word refugee. So what does this mean about the current geopolitical situation in Europe? Flight and migration are new, new phenomena. And many countries in Europe and the Middle East have been experiencing the recent refugee migration wave. The number of refugees coming to Europe has currently reached staggered proportions in some countries, and it is to some degree unpredictable as to what extent and in which countries this influx will increase or decrease. Thousands of young refugees are currently entering Europe. They're exposed to many risks, pre-flight, during their flight, and upon arrival, which make them vulnerable for the development of mental health problems. Our expertise as mental health professional is crucial for the promotion of a healthy adaptation of these young people and their families and to lower the risks of mental health problems. Now I would like to continue by taking a look at some recent uh, statistics. In the second quarter of uh, 2015, the five countries with the highest number of first-time asylum applications capita were Hungary, Austria, Sweden, Germany, and Malta. As you can see, in all of Europe, countries, first-time asylum applications increased. As conditions in the countries of origin and financial support of refugee camps deteriorated, more and more refugees have fled into different European countries following specific routes subject to the change over time. 
Turkey, Greece, Malta, and Italy have been witnessing the influx or transit of refugees for the past few years. In Greece, for example, more than 510,000 refugees, mainly stemming from Syria and Afghanistan, have arrived by boat via country's island in 2015. Let's take a closer look on the minor population. As you can see, 26% of all asylum applicants in 2014 were minors who have to pay attention to the fact that despite medical examinations, verification of the age of a young refugee may prove impossible sometimes, depending on the perceived benefits in the respective country of arrival, age may either be falsely self-reported as younger or older, and this may raise serious ethical questions for those involved. The dramatic development of the absolute number of unaccompanied minors merits consideration also. As the years go by, number of accompanied minors are increasing. In addition, there are some basic points of great importance. As a refugee's traumatic experience, we need to pay attention to the following parts. Obviously, the brief flight or pre-migration experiences of young refugees depend on their country of origin, exposures to poverty, war, or warlike conditions, uh, which are common. In addition, the acquired education, social status, familiar, religious, and sociocultural values have an important role also. So, healthcare professionals need to take into account that the citizenships of refugees differ substantially according to the respective European country in which they apply for asylum. Trauma is prevalent in refugee groups as a painful experience, and it is shown that trauma is related with mental health problems. In addition, it is very important to have in mind that children respond to trauma in different ways according to their age or stage of development. It is well documented that refugees and asylum seekers have experienced significant traumatic events which include war, torture, violence, targeted persecution, forced labor, forced migration, and family separation. Also, the flight in itself can be traumatic. Or compound trauma via, for instance, separation experiences, sexual abuse, and trafficking, including forced labor and sexual exploitation. Finally, the arrival in the hosting country entails risk due to unsafe or otherwise problematic living conditions. Within this context, the initial provision of a safe environment to traumatize young refugees should not be taken for credit. Now let's turn to the problem of physical health issues. After reaching the hosting country, the refugees are physically exhausted. At this stage, Provision of somatic health care represents a major concern. A lot of health problems appear in minor populations, such as laryngitis, etc., and these problems may deteriorate mental health issues. We need to make ourselves familiar with the mental health issues of refugees. However, Knowledge is limited and fragmented. It is shown that um, child and adolescent refugees are exposed to many risks pre-flight, during their flight, and upon arrival, which make them also vulnerable for the development of psychiatric disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety di disorders, mood disorders, or external externalized disorders. Among psychiatric disorders in refugees, PTSD is prevalent. All those studies demonstrate that the frequency and intensity of PTSD fluctuates based on the type of traumatic exposure. It has been identified in large numbers of refugees who have experienced pre-migratory trauma. And according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, among refugees ranges from 39 to 100% compared to 1% for the general population PTSD. 
The risk of developmental health problems proved to be elevated, particularly among unaccompanied refugees and in those with experience in detention. Uncompanied minors, most of them males from Afghanistan, were shown to be overrepresented in psychiatric inpatient care. Symptoms relating to stress and erotic disorders were more common in these groups. In a review of 26 studies, it was found that social support, acculturation strategies, education, religion, religion, avoidance, and hope were identified as six sources of resilience, most of which also had counterproductive aspects in your refugees who had resettled in Western countries. Resilience assessed 20 years after displacement of Sri Lankans proved to be more strongly and robustly associated with economic and social factors than with the presence of mental disorders. In addition, in a recent study which explored the perceptions of mental health services by accompanied refugee adolescents, it was found that refugees may hold negative attitudes toward mental health and distrust services potentially reflected their experiences within their home country of psychiatric care. Educational, acculturational, legal and ethical issues in addition to socioeconomical factors also influence the risk of mental illness. Evidence for the importance of family involvement, school settings as points of care and services and the focus on the first year of arrival was also detected. An assessment of the mental health and psychological needs of almost 8,000 Syrian participants in Jordan revealed persistent fear, anger, lack of interest in activities, hopelessness, and problems with basic functioning. Many Syrian adults report that the well-being and future potential of their children constitute their greatest source of stress. Many adults worry about their children and the impact of the horrors they have experienced. One describes his daughter as psychologically very affected by the war, anxious, scared, and unable to believe any war is safe. Parents and other family members exposed to traumatic experiences and psychic symptoms associated with stress and trauma are more likely to demonstrate poor parenting, including abuse and neglect in some cases. One of the senders, let me skip this. One of the senders that Syrian children receiving services named Center for Victims of Torture, uh, children asked to draw a safe place from their past in counseling groups, but sometimes it is shown that uh, are unable to access any non-violent memories and instead draw the tanks and soldiers that populate their neighborhoods. Sometimes children commonly express an enormous sense of personal responsibility, which is very important, for supporting and protecting family members, including their parents. Children may also protect parents by refraining from disclosing their own traumatic experiences and related symptoms. Moreover, even once migrants have settled and formed families, their children and the second generation migrants have an increased risk for mental health problems also. Mental health services can be a key, restoring basic psychological functioning and to supporting resilience and positive coping strategies for children, adolescents and adults. Our expertise as mental health professionals is crucial for the promotion of a healthy adaptation of these young people and their families and to lower their risks of mental health problems. In addition, it is important to identify young refugees with developing of pre-existing serious mental disorders and to ensure access to evidence-based psychiatric treatment. It is greatly important to consider that there are cultural and communication barriers which can have serious consequences in daily interaction with refugees as expert interpreting services is limited because many refugees do not speak our language and need to acculturate it will frequently take one to two years until they establish solid contacts with mental health services 
further employment and training of interpreters and by cultural workers and collaboration with the local cultural groups are necessitated. Also, practitioners may enhance their cultural competence through relevant knowledge accessible through refugee-specific websites. Also, we should reconsider our familial models of psychotherapy. Moreover, uh, refugees themselves may use such applications in order to get information, accept facilitation, and be aware of new actions tailored to their needs. There is a plenty of uh, very interesting websites like this. Well, according to in camps and uh, in case of uh, refugee, uh, there are plenty of proposed treatment methods. A group treatment to refugees who have experienced broadly similar events is very common. Strengthening the community and providing support to large groups through population-wide psychoeducational campaigns and targeting psychosocial risk factors which provide employment in refugee camps, refugee rates of depression, and also involvement in religious activities. Let's take a look uh, on a Greek island, Lesbos, where, psycholo where head psychologists have only a few days to help the waves of arriving refugees before they move on. Severe trauma causes are seen on a daily basis on Lesbos. The Guardian recently reported that nearly 550,000 of refugees have come through Lesbos. While most humanitarian aid missions on the island are focused on food, shelter, and other emergency needs, small teams of therapists and social workers are scrambling to provide coping methods to an unknown number of diagnosed trauma victims. Because of the short time frame and limited resources, many therapists on Lesbos rely on conventional PTSD treatments like CBT, a short-term intervention method designed to help patients reframe the way they think about a traumatic experience. But therapists are generally careful to avoid pushing the patients toward dragging up too many painful memories, exposing deep wounds, without the time or resources to help them to properly heal, could cause more harm than good as the refugees leave Lesbos and move forward on their journeys. A primary objective is to facilitate a shift in self-image from passive victim to active survivor who can draw on their experience to positively affect others. So survivors be able to recover from psychological and physical symptoms, helping them to successfully regain control of their lives. At the same time, groups focus on building coping skills needed to navigate challenges common to the refugee context and difficult family dynamics. Safety and the care relationships serve as the foundations for later exploration of traumatic experience and their associated emotions, fear, shame, guilt, loss, sorrow, etc., culminated in an eventual connection with self, others, and life. All current structures, healthcare financing, and ways of working are often focused on the individual or families. However, to meet the challenge, we might need to adopt a more public health approach. Except for mental disorders, clinicians should give a special emphasis toward understanding refugees' experiences and challenges with the new environment and toward fostering resilience among individuals and communities. This should be the basis for advocating to health policymakers. Closing, I would like to repeat a quote. Refugees are going to continue to come, and only question is what we are going to do to help them. Thank you. And we will continue with our last speech by uh, Anastasia Diakumopoulou on working with refugees, uh, the experience in primary care. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Okay, just a minute. I'm uh, Natasha Diakumopoulou. I am a psychiatrist. I work uh, with refugees 
Since August of 2016, I work in a program funded by UNHCR, which is called Relocation Scheme Project. And um, I will start by saying who is a refugee. Um, a refugee is someone who has been forced to flee his or her country because of per persecution, war, or violence. A refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Most likely, they cannot return home or are afraid to do so. War and ethnic, tribal, and religious violence are leading causes of refugees fleeing their countries. Some very few statistics from UNHCR from 2015. About 65.3 million people have been forced from home around the world. Among them are nearly 21.3 million refugees, over half of whom are under the age of 18. There are also 10 million stateless people who have been denied a nationality and access to basic rights such as education, health care, employment, and freedom of movement. Um, nearly 34,000 people are forcibly displaced every day as a result of conflict or persecution. In Europe now, 49,000 Almost 50,000 people have risked their lives to reach Europe by sea so far in 2017, and um, 1,344 feared drones so far in 2017. The numbers are huge. So about my job, what we are doing in Athens, we're two medical teams. There's pediatrician, internist, uh, gynecologist, uh, psychiatrist, and psychologist. Um, both the teams work for this program. Uh, it has been renamed. It began as relocation, and now it is an accommodation program because many of the refugees um, have uh, will stay here, will stay in Greece. Um, the first team, where I belong, is located at the Medical Center of Patricia in Athens. We receive referrals from our program. We have almost 1,600 people, adults and children, located in apartments in Athens, as well as from other uh, NGOs and organizations such as RC, Solidarity Now, and Doctors Without Borders. People who we treat live either in apartments or in camps. For example, the referrals from the Doctors Without Borders come mostly from camps. All of them are adults, um, and uh, there is no significant number difference between men and women as, as far as the uh, psychological support and psychiatric disorders are concerned. Populations come mostly from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and much fewer from Africa and Palestinians as well. The most violent narrations come from Iraq. There is war in Syria, but uh, the, the conditions in Iraq are, there are no words to describe what we hear. Uh, mass execution, systematic rape, and um, Horrendous acts of violence are widespread in Iraq. Human rights and rule of law are under constant attack. So what are the challenges when we work with refugee population? Challenges and difficulties at the same time. So first of all, we have the refugee barriers, okay? Um, they have difficulties to seek out services. There is stigma um, around mental health. They tell me uh, quite often, they used to tell me that uh, in their countries only the crazy go to the psychiatrist. Um, then there is a distrust of authority and systems of care because they, they are they're suspicious because they have they had to deal with so many difficulties during the journey, so they do not trust easily the system.
uh, the families recognize that there are many problems, psychological, but they have to deal with other resettlement stressors like housing, employment, and uh, they believe that uh, these issues are much more important than go to the psychiatrist. They are uh, not very well informed of services, and the truth is that the referral networks are limited. The language is um, a huge problem. Parents and children are not proficient in English, of course, and the role of interpreter is vital. We will talk about this uh, a little later. Then there are difficulties um, at expressing feelings. Uh, they need psychoeducation um, as far as um, recognizing and expressing emotions. Um, and they are unfamiliar with psychiatric disorders, of course. Um, there are also many cultural barriers. For example, during the month of Ramadan, um, which starts in a few days, I think tomorrow, no, on Saturday, they don't want to visit the doctors because um, they don't want to talk. Um, then they have, um, they, they, then there are other uh, things such as um, stereotypes. They, they often um, tell me that, you know, back to my country, the drug users get imprisoned. <clears throat> so they, they, they have uh, difficulty to uh, open the, th <clears throat> excuse me, to open the issue of um, drug or alcohol abuse. Um, and alcohol use, for example, is forbidden by the religion. Um, it, is the, it is forbidden, but quite often there is misuse of uh, alcohol. Um, cultural practices such as violence against women is accepted uh, by Muslims. So, societies by, so domestic violence is difficult to be revealed. Um, the difference between a psychologist, what a psychologist does, and what a psychiatrist does is totally unclear. And uh, now the difficulties, difficulties, the barriers uh, as far as the assessment is concerned. First of all, the cultural validity, how closely concepts in a questionnaire, for example, match local concepts. Uh, most of the times, Western concepts may not apply locally. Unknown local concepts, um, they might be very important, but uh, I'm not aware of them. So how can I include uh, questions? I don't know I should, be dust, I should be dusting. Or how to include the question. Thank you. Or how to include the question um, in a not insulting way. For example, the, uh, the alcohol use. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a very important uh, question when um, we examine uh, a person, but um, Sometimes the interpreter, for example, has difficulties to ask because it is thought that if somebody is Muslim, that means he or she never drinks, um, especially towards women. The, this question is quite difficult, especially to, to, towards women. And of course, the translation problems, who translates? So the interpreter's role is uh, vital, is very important. Um, I have written here an example, which I find it really interesting. Um, during examination with a drug addicted person, the interpreter told me that he could not, he could not ask the person if he has uh, suicide thoughts because he couldn't bear the question and would cry. The interpreter would cry. Um, the interpreter often replies instead of the person who is examined. Um, the refugee builds a personal relationship with the interpreter. Quite often he, she asks for interpreter's trust, trust by saying, I will tell you something, I will tell you a secret, <clears throat> but do not tell it to the doctor, please. The interpreters are not always well trained, especially for mental health issues. There are many difficulties. For instance, the word support cannot be sufficiently translated in Arabic. So they have to describe it. Um, I would also like to, to add here that um, um, 
many things we uh, believe as doctors, as psychiatrists, that are clear, are totally unclear for, uh, for refugees. Uh, for example, the simple question, how do you sleep, how is your sleep? It can be uh, quite complicated because they do not understand this. You have to explain, um, <clears throat> when I ask you how do you sleep, I mean, do you sleep the whole, lot the, the whole night? Um, do you wake up early in the morning? Uh, do you feel tired? You have to do many questions because it, they will um, simply tell you, tamam, it's okay, um, everything is fine with my sleep, but they do not sleep well. So, um, most of them, uh, when they, they reach a psychiatrist, uh, ask for a people to forget or sleep. They do not understand the importance of adherence. They feel better, they stop taking the medication. This is a rule. Others believe that medication is addictive or will make them sleep. Now, practical issues that, uh, such as medication is not easily affordable and we have to look for uh, uh, whatever we can, um, at social pharmacies. Follow-ups, um, one appointment is enough. Difficulty at keeping uh, stability at follow-ups. Um, they believe it's okay, I've seen the psychiatrist once, I feel better, that's enough. Um, it takes much more time to establish a therapeutic uh, relation, but it continues to be very important. So, as far as the, the disorders, the psychiatric disorders and the symptoms, uh, the stress from the instability, in addition to the trauma they already experience, means that refugees are particularly vulnerable to mental disorders. The most common are depression, depression, PTSD, anxiety disorders, sleep disorders, psychosis, personality disorders, alcohol abuse, and of course, suicidal attempts. So, um, this is um, a case, it's not something, um, something we don't see in Greece or in Europe, but it's interesting as far as the cultural um, uh, thing is concerned. Uh, Amira is a young woman, around 30 years old, old, from Syria. She lives in Athens with her mother, one younger sister, who is married with two little, little children, but her husband has taken the children away from here to Panis here, and the niece. They are in Athens of, for a few months, I think five or six months, and uh, they're going to leave Athens, to leave Greece for Germany. The father of the, of the family has a long time ago. The rest of brothers and sisters live in Germany. The three women and the niece have been accepted to Germany and their journey, journey will take place soon. Treatments and follow relationships. She now takes olanzapine, okay, 20 milligram. She asks for her pill, pill and remains stable. This is quite characteristic that uh, in Syria, psychiatry, psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia are still thought to be, uh, are still treated um, in a way that uh, we only read in books. So, as conclusions, um, mental health support in the refugees is often neglected. Uh, in the current refugee crisis, with tens of thousands of desperate and exhausted refugees attempting to reach safe heavens in Europe, mental health and psychosocial well-being is somewhat overlooked uh, amid all the needs that are crying for attention, says Peter Fentefogel, uh, who is Senior Mental Health Officer at UN Refugee Agency. I think this is quite important that these people, refugees, are not psychologically weak. Most of them uh, we meet have traveled for one year or more before landing in Greece, so one year of danger, of dangerous situation. The stressful wait during the months after our arrival is often when trauma takes shape. The past comes back, the present is difficult, the future is uncertain. People sometimes arrive in good, good mental health and become increasingly depressed as the months wear on. 
Perhaps the most important thing to do is to treat refugees with respect and dignity, preserving and strengthening their autonomy and self-efficacy. And, uh, uh, and one, more, one last thing, we are facing the biggest refugee and displacement crisis of our time. Above all, this is not just a crisis of numbers, it is also a crisis of... Solidarity. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have uh, a few minutes for uh, some questions, if there are any. I think the, all the speakers pointed out the, uh, the heterogeneity of the problem. It's quite different to be a first generation Greek, immigra Greek, Greek immigrant to the UK in the 90s and uh, much different to be a Syrian refugee in Central Europe today. It's, it's, it's totally different things. So uh, we, cannot, we cannot have uh, a similar approach to this problem. Also, there was a uh, mentioning of the so-called regression to the mean effect, which means that in, in some cases, the first generation is healthier than the local population, the first generation of immigrants is healthier than the local population because there is some kind of natural selection, healthier individuals immigrate. But then we have a regression to the mean during, uh, for the second and third immigrations, uh, second generations. So second and third generations are more similar to the general population and they still face highly stressful situations. So this is an explosive condition. So are there any questions? If not, we will continue with Professor Duzenis to take the chair. Okay, I think we are ready to start the next uh, step on this uh, very interesting concept. In this very interesting conference, uh, we will have a lecture by Professor Konstantinos Fundulakis, who is the president of the organizing committee for this conference. Uh, Professor Fundulakis is uh, probably one of the widest known psychiatrists in Greece in the current state. He has achieved 
amazing things in the sense that he is the publication, publi he's, the, he's the person, he's the sole author of the bipolar disorders edited by Springer. He is an editor of a well-reputed psychiatric journal, and he is also uh, associate professor in psychiatry in the Thessaloniki University in the Aristotelian. So, okay. Uh, and I will present uh, his lecture. We know that uh, psychiatry is a very interesting principle, uh, but history of psychiatry is, is even more interesting. So, uh, Professor Fondoulakis will present on a critical review of the history of the develop development of treatments for mental disorders. I think we had to wait for a little more for Costas to come. He will be with us in one moment, I guess. There he is. There you are, Costas. So he, Professor Vundulakis hasn't heard the introduction, so you can tell him later what we have just said. <laughs> So thank you for whatever you said in my absence. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the history of treatment of mental disorders. And I'll try not to be a presentation of historical uh, facts and figures also uh, alone, uh, because it's, it's very easy to find narrations of history in uh, textbooks. The question is whether we can we can learn anything from history. And if, if things that we can learn can deepen our, can deepen our understanding of uh, our current knowledge, and whether we can, we're able to predict things of the future by uh, understanding the past. So there's also, there seems to be always a chain of events often this chain of events seem to be unrelated to each other. Um, but there is also some important hidden message in this chain of events that leads to uh, an innovation. And it is the rare exception that discoveries happen by chance. I remember that in, in school, in high school and in uh, elementary school, uh, a, a, a very common way of teaching history was uh, that by chance they found something. By chance they observed something. This is, this is the rare exception, although we teach it as the rule. And why, why does this happen? This happens because it is much more, much more um, pleasant for the average uh, general uh, public. And also, often, it is very convenient because people who gave their names in the discovery of things, often they, um, they keep out of sight some dark aspects of their effort, like uh, breaking uh, copyrights, stealing ideas, or uh, putting people uh, in the corner and taking all the advantage, all, all, the, all the spotlights of publicity and fame on themselves. Uh, such, such, a, um, such an example is penicillin and Fleming. Fleming was probably the one who least contributed to the development of penicillin. Uh, but if I ask anybody of you here uh, who was the inventor of penicillin, you will reply Fleming. Also Edison and electricity. Today, the electrical systems are based on Tesla theory, not Edison. But everybody knows Edison and not Tesla. And this, this thing with, with these two people is because both Fleming and Edison were masters of the mass media of the time. So this is a recurring pattern in, in the history of uh, innovation and also affects the, innovation, the, the history of mental treatments development. So what I want to, to stress here is it, that it was the painful chase and the hard labor of people behind, who led to these innovations. And these innovations are miraculous. 
in spite of the fact that today we are not satisfied with what we have in hand, we must think where from we started and where are today. We started in the late 19th and early 20th century with big asylums full of stocked with people. And today we are talking about rehabilitation. It's night and day. It's not absolutely satisfactory, but it's a huge progress. So the history of psychiatric therapeutics in many aspects reflects the attitudes of the society towards madness, towards insanity. And it reflects two major things. The first is whether society invests in the well-being and uh, humanity of patients, or on the contrary, it invests on their isolation and restraint. There are two different, often balancing, but generally two different opposing aspects. And also, it reflects the changing concept of mental illness. We should be aware that psychiatry comes, modern psychiatry in modern times, comes from alienists. And alienists were doctors of the asylums. So psychiatry started with schizophrenia, with the asylum in saints. Then it went on to drug abusers in the late 19th, early 20th century. And today, after the second, uh, with the second half of the 20th century, it deals more with what we call common mental disorders, which is mild depression, personality disorders, and some may be more psychological rather than psychiatric conditions. Also, therapeutics reflect uh, a number of ideological and philosophical issues, including what we consider our place in, in the world and within society, what is our place in the world and society, uh, what is the, our values, and what is what we wish for our common future for uh, the development of our society and uh, the world. So it's, it's a deeply philosophical feature, uh, issue in, in many aspects. So if we, we start with, uh, with pure history and start with the antiquity, the earliest psychiatric treatment we know is trephination. And trephination uh, started something like uh, 5,000 years BC. We have some skulls, especially from the Peru. And these skulls, as we, you can see, they have, they have uh, signs of healing around the cat, which means that these people survived at least enough so the, the bone um, developed. And the, here is the, the famous painting by Hieronymus Bosch, the removal of the stone of insanity from the head of a patient. But of course, we all know that during the classic antiquity in ancient Greece and Rome, there were the, the worship of Asclepius. And Asclepius had um, five daughters, Hygia, Iaso, Akeso, Egli, and Panakia, these four daughters, health, healing, uh, therapy, prestige, and Panakia. Panakia is uh, a, a medication that treats everything. Uh, so these five daughters re uh, reflect aspects of medicine. Romans had a sixth daughter for Asclepius that was Meditrina, reflecting the use of herbs and uh, lay person's uh, treatment options. Also, we know uh, about the snakes, which were uh, freely uh, moving in the floors of Asclepion. And uh, they gave their image in the logo of medicine today. Uh, the general approach was uh, a mixture of uh, religious rituals, interpretation of dreams for the first time, and also the use of uh, the theory of uh, human body humors. Uh, their, their imbalance was 
suggested to lead to mental disorders. So if you used enemas or um, uh, induced vomiting, then these humors uh, would uh, balance again and uh, health will return. Uh, it is interesting to see the, the myth of Jason and media and the expedition in the Caucasus area. Uh, Jason in, in Greek means the healer and media has a name which has the same root as Midi, which was the ancient uh, Greek name for uh, the Persian Empire. Also, it comes from the Greek verb Mideo, which means I take care and I organize. So uh, what this, this uh, myth could say is that uh, healers from Greece took knowledge from the barbarians from the Caucasus era, from the Black Sea, and brought back both a primitive uh, form of medicine plus social organization, a primitive way of health care. It is interesting that uh, Jason left Media for the sake of Glavka, and Glavka uh, is the bird of uh, wisdom of goddess Athena. So the healer left the pagan way, the barbarian pagan way of uh, primitive medicine for some kind of scientific ways and knowledge. In, gen in general, in the uh, Greek Roman world, there was an admixture of religion, philosophy, uh, and practicality. And there were three major psychological treatments in the Hippocratic medicine, inducing sleep, inter interpreting dreams, and using words to persuade some kind of primitive psychotherapeutic method. Um, it, it is said that Asclepiades from Bithynia was the first to free the insane from their confinement, from the chains, which is, um, uh, which is an event celebrated in the uh, early 19th century. In India, we have uh, similar theories of that of the humorous uh, theories of Hippocrates. What is interesting is that for the first time in Indian text, uh, shocking of the patient is recommended. And I am mentioning this because shocking the patient starts uh, at some time, uh, two or 300 years BC for the first time, and it is a concept which is almost believed until today. In ancient China, we had the imbalance of yang and ying, which is a, again a reflection of human fluids and in, in uh, accord with the universe, the cosmos, and the earth. In Hebrew, it was a purely religious approach. Uh, and it is interesting that also in Persia, and Persia was a rather sophisticated society. Uh, again, in Persia, uh, we have only uh, religious approaches to mental health. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we had a domination, of course, of religious and metaphysical approaches with uh, treatment including from uh, exorcisms to confession, uh, to folk remedies, to esoteric medicines. Uh, and at some time, at, at, at some time, there was a combination between uh, religious approaches and scientific treatments because monasteries were uh, de developed from purely religious establishments to some kind of quasi-scientific centers. So healers were both monks and doctors of some time, and they used uh, a combination of religious and scientific treatments. The Arab scholars mainly uh, copied and reproduced earlier uh, knowledge, while in the uh, Byzantine Empire, uh, we have, uh, for the first time, uh, the establishment of what is called Xenones, uh, an early form of hospitals. In Western Europe, we had the first asylums. The first was probably in Valencia in 1409. Uh, this is what it is uh, formally written in textbooks, but probably the first uh, one um, was established in Hamburg in 1375. 
The word asylum, of course, comes from the Greek word asylon, which means a place which is sacred and nobody can, can trespass. In Byzantium, however, was the first uh, psychiatric department, and in Constantinople, there was a big hospital called uh, Xenon Pandocrator. It was a huge hospital. Uh, there is nothing uh, remaining today, not even its, uh, um, its uh, regulation, but we know, and this is impressive, uh, that it had a separate uh, neurological and a separate psychiatric department. It had two priests on duty around the clock, and it also provided medical treatment in combination with some kind of uh, religious consultation. Uh, later in England, we have the Bethlehem Hospital, which is later called the Betham, and the Petit Chapelier in Paris. There was a legislation in France which uh, put the foundations for the first sexualization, sectoralization of the country in the 17th century. So this, this legislation demanded that there would be a, a, a huge asylum in every section of the time. And a dominating attitude of the time, a dominating belief, was that patients can freely choose between rational and insanity. So what can we do to force them to choose rationality? We should shock them. This is the ancient Indian approach, shocking the patient. So they developed a number of uh, treatment options to shock the patient and force him to come to his mind. You can see the spinning chair. I don't have a laser. So we have a spinning chair here uh, and a seclusion chair, tranquilizing chair, which uh, prevented the patient from seeing, hearing, and moving, so it was getting tranquilized. These were the treatment options of the time. But in the, more, in the modern age, we have uh, an event which is much celebrated, as I said, freeing the uh, insane from their chains. However, the, uh, the asylums were, at that time, they were full, not only with uh, uh, crazy people, with insane people, but w with any, any kind of uh, uh, people with problems with the law, uh, poverty, orphans, whatever. Uh, there were, uh, the conditions within asylums were uh, completely horrible, and it is not exactly known what historically happened. For example, there is some dispute that Pinel ever did what is depicted in this specific painting. However, it is a fact that uh, Vincenzo Ciarugi in Italy, in Santa Maria Nuova, and Bonifacio in Florence, they freed the insane from confinement for the first time in modern history. At that time, however, asylums were using a number of different approaches to keep under control and to try to have some kind of treatment with patients with sedatives, opium grains and labdanum, and also alcohol. Uh, even Thomas Seidenham was uh, recommending these substances. Hypnosis by Mesmer, and also we have this jacket, you know, this uh, straight jacket. Uh, it was in use uh, t uh, since the 16th century. We don't know really who designed it and who used it for the first time. An important evolution for science in general, but for psychiatry in particular, was the uh, introduction of taxonomy and classification by Linnaeus in Sweden. Linnaeus classified animals and plants. This is an old idea which uh, has its roots in Aristotle's, the Scala Hierarchica of uh, Aristotle's, with uh, uh, non-living matter in, uh, at the basis and uh, uh, humans at the top of the pyramid. 
But this was an incomplete and philosophical um, classification. Linnaeus did a scientific classification, and this uh, created a, a wave of enthusiasm because it was considered that this was a tool that could uh, help people to classify disorders, to classify diseases, and by classifying, you could find ways of treatment and uh, etiopathogenetic factors and risk factors. Pinel introduced the moral treatment of his sanity, and uh, also in uh, the early 19th century, we had the rational psychotherapy and the introduction of the term psychiatry by Johann Reil, whose name was also given in a structure of the brain, the Reil insel. Also, we have the first psychiatric journal at that time. In the 19th century, the major evolution is that non-restraint is established formally and by law the standard of care. Until that time, the standard of care was confinement and seclusion. Now, the standard is non-confinement and non-restraint and seclusion. In 1843, we have the first decision, decision by court, uh, non-guilty by reasons of insanity. Uh, it was a murder case. Uh, a Scottish man killed one of the secretaries of the king and was proven, uh, was uh, judged not guilty by means of insanity by the court. It was a very important case because also the victim was a very important man of the British society at that time. It is interesting that we have the Utica crib. The Utica crib was a horrible cage, a very narrow cage for agitated pe persons. And for the first time in the mid 19th century, we have the use of lithium uh, treatment introduced into medicine. We start here with uh, uric acid detected in, in the bloodstream of patients with uh, uh, uric arthritis. Then there was a concept that mania is an uric disease of the brain. So if uh, we need to remove uric acid from the brain, and how we can do this? If you, if you put uh, uric acid from patients, from the, from the joints of patients with uric arthritis into water, uh, and you also drop lithium in this water, then uric acid dissolves in water. So what we need to do is to give people drink lithium for uric arthritis, but also for uh, mood disorders. This was a completely um, wrong way of thinking, but still, it worked. This is the Utica crib. It, uh, it was uh, held responsible even for deaths. Imagine uh, an agitated patient secluded like this. Uh, he could uh, easily die from uh, a number of somatic factors. In the late 19th century, uh, a number of other compounds is put into use, like Atropa belladonna, uh, Mandragora. Uh, one important development was the hollow needle and the syringe in the, uh, 1953. So it is now easy to use opium uh, intravenously, which is something it is uh, recommended by Krafing, uh, Kraft Ebbing as a treatment op option for mental patients. At that time, also, we have the introduction of the term psychotherapia from the Greek word psyche, which is soul. Originally, it's the butterfly, but it means soul, literally, and therapy. The first uh, community psychiatry hint was uh, mentioned in 1959 by George Robinson, followed by a number of other compounds like bromide, uh, uh, chloride, paraldehyde, and uh, a number of beverages with lithium uh, circulating around in the free market. It is important to say that uh, at the early 
the late 19th century, early 20th century, there were a number of uh, beverages like Seven Up, uh, which originally included lithium, and Coca-Cola originally included cocaine. Uh, these were um, removed uh, cocaine from Coca-Cola in 1912, and uh, lithium uh, from 7-Up uh, a little bit later. But a number of beverages and uh, healing, uh, uh, healing uh, uh, compounds were circulating freely in the market, promising everything, removing uric acid from the system, uh, brightening the mood, whatever. The first uh, use of uh, lithium was, as I said, in the mid-19th century. But in 1871, Alexander Hammond uh, was the first to use uh, lithium as a specific psychotropic agent on the basis of uh, the concept that mania is an uric acid disease of the brain. And in general, the problem with the late 19th century is that we experienced the darkest period of psychiatry. All the treatments used by that time, uh, especially the moral treatment of uh, Morel and all, all the efforts to treat mental patients had uh, largely failed. So what happened for the second time was that asylums became big prison-like institutions uh, with prisoners having conducted no crime. There were uh, insane people inside, prostitutes, poor people, orphans, whatever you can imagine at the side, at the periphery of society, excluded from normal social life. So uh, the main the main issue with this asylum big institution was uh, discipline of this huge crowd rather than treatment or um, returning back to the society. This is, this is the darkest hour of psychiatry. It seemed that the Enlightenment and its ideology and care for humanity has failed in psychiatry. And at that time, however, some sparks started to brighten uh, darkness. In 1883, we have the synthesis of the phenothiazine nucleus, which would later give birth to antipsychotics. We have the concept of receptors in 1890. Amphetamines in, 19, uh, in 1893. Deep sleep therapy. Deep sleep therapy is something that uh, many, many colleagues discuss even today. Put him to sleep, and through sleep, he will come down and wake up um, another person. This was uh, introduced by Neil MacLeod in Shanghai for the treatment of opium addicts in uh, 1896. However, a number of peculiar theories uh, and uh, practices, some of them rather brutal, also existed at that time. For example, they were using aggressive uh, surgery to remove any tissue that could, uh, could be responsible for some kind of inflammation. For example, uh, gynecological surgery. Uh, here we have a bias against females because it was uh, believed that um, uh, hysteria uh, and the female uh, genital uh, organs uh, are, play some kind of role in uh, mental diseases in females. And also, if you, uh, if you uh, catch in your mind the, uh, the conditions of hygiene in asylums, all these women will, would suffer from a number of infections from teeth to genitals. So aggressive Sur uh, surgical um, operations to remove any possible uh, site of infection, including female genitals, were applied, of course, with a huge failure to treat the underlying mental conditions. Psychoanalysis is introduced 
in the Change of the Century by Sigmund Freud. And psychoanalysis is what heralds the coming of the 20th century, followed by psychobiology by Adolf Meyer a few years later. Kreppelin uh, makes the first step towards the current nosological approach. And Wagner Jaurek in uh, uh, 1917 induced malaria fever for the treatment of syphilis. We should note here that a large number of uh, patients uh, chronically um, treated in asylums were syphilitic patients rather than schizophrenics. We have also narcoanalysis and electronarcosis as add-on to psychoanalytic therapy, and we have the little Arbet experiment by uh, John Watson. Here we can see hydrotherapy, which was very popular uh, at that time, uh, both uh, cold and uh, hot water, depends on the preferences of the therapist, uh, both uh, in uh, uh, as steam, as bathing water, or as something that hurts. And again, we have the shock of the brain as, as a theory. This is, again, I say, this is a, re a recurrent theme, shocking. And this reemergence of the shock theory by Constance Pascal in 1926 gave rise in the long term to electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, the first efforts to induce shock was spinning care, chairs and seclusion, but then we had insulin shock therapy and uh, other, uh, other methods to induce shock, especially to induce uh, epileptic uh, fits, and eventually, as I said, as I said, it led to the electroshock. And this is important because in many textbooks you can you can read the history of electroconvulsive therapy as a more or less lucky guess, something that happened by random. It did not happen by random. Uh, it happened because. Um, Manfred Sakel used insulin to shock the patient by inducing hypoglycemic coma and epileptic uh, uh, fits. And Ladislav Meduna uh, used uh, the cardiazole treatment also to uh, induce shock. The problem is that by inducing uh, epileptic fits by means of insulin or cardiazole, this was a horrifying experience, and cardiazole specifically uh, triggered epileptic fits uh, weeks or months after treatment, so it was not a proper way of treatment. A proper way would be to induce epileptic fits by means of electricity. And eventually we need to say that in spite of the early enthusiastic reports on the usefulness of insulin treatment, there was a number of uh, studies in the late 60s that rejected its efficacy. We all know the lobotomy uh, induced by uh, Agas Moniz. Again, he received Nobel Prize in uh, 1948. Uh, and lobotomy was uh, trivialized by, uh, by Walter Freeman in the 60s and 70s. The eyes peak lobotomy, you can see through the through the nasal cavity, uh, he was uh, able to access very easily the prefrontal area and cut the uh, fibers connecting the prefrontal lobe with uh, the basal ganglia. Electroconvulsive therapy in 1938 by Hugo Cerletti and Lucio Bini. They didn't receive the Nobel Prize because of a matter of uh, administrative issues and also because of conflict between the two of them. And then 
After the Second World War, John Cade was an Australian GP who was taken prisoners after the siege of Singapore by the Japanese. He spent some three or four years in a Japanese uh, camp of uh, war prisoners and experienced a, a huge number of post-traumatic stress disorder. And after the war, he, ex he, he experimented with, uh, the induct with the use of lithium to treat these conditions. He uh, gave lithium and reported the first beneficial uh, treatment cases, but also the first death from lithium toxemia some eight months after the starting uh, of lithium treatment. At that time, there was also a bitter conflict between somatic therapists and psychoanalysts, which led eventually to uh, Menninger uh, writing articles in the lay press against ECT. Also, there was a split in the British Psychoanalytical Society between Kleinian and Freudian. And there was a third party, some kind of independent. The emergence of the ICD and a hidden history is that in 1949, a paper from India suggesting a new treatment for essential hypertension on the basis of Raoulthia serpentina. We do not have the full names of these people. We do not have their photos. Still, they are lost but not forgotten uh, heroes of medical history. And then we have, in 1952, the first DSM. John Cade, as I said, introduced lithium, later uh, confirmed its efficacy by, by Morgan Scow and Paul Christian Bastrup. The first proper ECT in psychiatry was conducted by Louis Lasagna, who was uh, the father of uh, American pharmacology in 1952. And the second half of the 20th century is considered to be the psychopharmacological era. This is, this is not true. Psychopharmacology started in the uh, 1850s, at, as, as early as 1871, when Alexander Hammond used lithium. However, usually, and uh, um, by um, consensus, we, we consider the beginning of psychopharmacology to have happened with the introduction of chloropromazine. And there are mainly three persons involved in the development of chloropromazine. That was Henri Laborie, Pierre de Niquier, and Jean Delay. Again, there was no Nobel here. And there was no Nobel because of bitter conflict between them, between the two and the first. It is completely unknown why Laborie, who was a surgeon, insisted in the use of chloropromazine for the treatment of mental patients. And also, there was a group of psychiatrists from the military hospital in Paris who published uh, a paper weeks later uh, after uh, Delay and Deniquier on the same subject, and they're completely unknown to the general public. Probably these people were the first to use chloropromazine for the treatment of psychotic patients, and Delay and Deniquier copied their, um, uh, their idea. What is generally said is that they used, they, they, they took the, the, um, the surgery method of Laborie, who was uh, conducting some kind of cryosurgery by putting um, sacks of uh, ice around the body of the patient and then performed surgery. So they copied the, the whole procedure by uh, putting people in bath tubes full of ice and giving them chloropromazine. And at some time, uh, the institution could not supply so much ice. And during weekends, uh, the nurses were giving chloropromazine alone. This is, this is the official history. But probably, as I said, this is not really true. So this is the chronological uh, table for the uh, development of uh, antipsychotics and antidepressants. And here we have a detailed 
a detailed uh, table of what is the major evolutions uh, in the late 20th century. Um, I think you can find everything in standard texts. Uh, what I want to stress here is that we had a number of uh, political events like social and political uprising in France in 1968, which put a very heavy scar on French psychiatry. Uh, and then we had the, a, a dispute on the efficacy of uh, antidepressants. And more recently, we have a similar dispute on the efficacy of antipsychotics. Uh, this was not contained within the scientific um, community, but it also affected uh, the general public with uh, a series of uh, films. The most known, the most well-known with five Oscars is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was a gravestone for uh, the ECT. And you can see the psychiatrist who also starred in, uh, in this film, uh, embracing uh, the apparatus which sprayed water on uh, patients. And it's the same apparatus that uh, the huge Indian uh, ripped off the floor and uh, threw it against the window to break um, the glass and uh, escape away. And also we experience the development of a number of uh, uh, groups against psychiatry, uh, with uh, the more aggressive being Scientology, which has also come to Southern Europe and Greece recently, uh, with a number of um, uh, objections in their agenda against psychiatry. It is generally an anti-psychiatric movement, not exactly the way SADS uh, was conceiving uh, and uh, writing uh, for anti-psychiatry, but a more, a most, a, a more postmodern anti-psychiatry agenda. Uh, we also experience the infiltration of, uh, um, of the pharma industry in scientific decisions with advertisement, like this is my favorite advertisement, it washes your blues away for fluoxetine. And this is, uh, this is the, uh, the media uh, for the antidepressant case. And the question is where we are and what is the future from now on? What can we say? What is our understanding of the past and what is the prediction for the future? Well, it's difficult to say, but what we can have as a conclusion is that current models of etiopathogenesis are exhausted. If we are talking about the dopaminergic hypothesis of schizophrenia, we have antidopaminergic drugs, probably this is what we can have. We can have agents with uh, less side effects, but probably not with uh, better efficacy. The same is for SSRIs, serotonin, and depression. The same holds true for psychotherapies. Uh, if psychotherapies work the, to the extent uh, we, we believe they are, we are currently discussing where we, whether we can uh, uh, use them through the internet to assess, to, to access more people and to distribute psychotherapeutic services throughout the community. If, if internet approaches are as good as face-to-face uh, -face methods, okay, that's it, uh, but it's not better that uh, formal psychotherapy. So our current models of eti etiopathogenesis and treatment are exhausted, and we are distilling uh, very, very minor things to, to have a better uh, distribution of these methods to the general uh, pool of patients. What can be done is that we need better research testing of treatment options. Uh, there is a number of uh, naturalistic and epidemiological studies that may be uh, put more fog than clarify things. We need open, to raw, open access to raw data. Uh, it is uh, rather unacceptable that uh, we do not have raw data access to uh, clinical trials happened 10 or 15 years ago, and at any case, the patents have uh, 
uh, are not uh, no longer valid. So the pharma industry has no uh, real uh, benefit from uh, uh, keeping this uh, raw data secret. Uh, also, there is a movement suggesting that if there is a compound that it's approved for the treatment of a specific disorder, then for this specific compound, the specific raw data that were used for labeling in the FDA and the MA should be publicly available. We need better treatment options. Better treatment options will come from better uh, or from new models of etiopathogenesis. Currently, I have nothing new in my head. And we need better management of sociocultural issues and civil rights. It is the question of uh, um, where, where is the threshold from mental health to mental disorder? Uh, where are the, uh, the rights of patients to refuse treatment? What happens with involuntary admissions? Uh, and what happens with forensic issues? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Fundulakis. It's always very stimulating to hear your account. It's, there are many things that have been exhausted. There are things, a few things that, even from the historical perspective, that have not been exhausted. Yet the inflammation theory is not, has not reached its, its peak, I think. There are things to be explored as well. But I, am, I, I would agree very strongly about the, the need to implement uh, higher higher consensus treatment options and uh, involving the research, the, the clients themselves, the patients themselves. We need to be able to, to do ethical research and that is that has a long way to go. So if people want to ask questions or make a point, please. Yeah. If you would like to, to say your name as well, yes. for the people who don't know you. Yes, my name is uh, Reznik. I would like to uh, pr present my deep uh, congratulations and gratitude to your very, very open and sincere talk, uh, critically reviewing the last, uh, last uh, achievements that we uh, in the psychopharmacology uh, had, no, had no any new options being provided for the last 20 years for the society or for our patients. My name is Reznik, I'm a, a psychiatrist from Israel. So I'm also here on behalf of our International Association of Cannabinoid Medicine. So my, my opinion is this probably endocannabinoid system is a one system that had never been studied uh, toward that uh, proper treatment for the patients, just all, always looking as a uh, abuser potentials and never had been used for the mainstream medicine for the last uh, 12 years. We have a very good progress in this and we have a very good results even in the controlled trials. So some probable, probably uh, but uh, negative. new things. But negative results. Yes, some, but very good results. We need to provide better treatment options. I absolutely agree with you. Cannabinoid medicine, one of them. Probably the new is something that had been in pharmacopoeia 100 years ago and now is going back on the better clinical and scientific ground. Uh, my suggestion is that we need to introduce cannabinoid medicine in all countries and it should be studied uh, clearly and we could provide it as a better option for our patients. Thank you. Well, um, you. as I said, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the trials are negative, and uh, also they, they, they go through the, the dopamine system. So with, uh, with cannabinoids, eventually they go through the dopamine system if there is something there. But anyway, we will see. Great talk, uh, and I, I love the history that you provided for, uh, for us because most of us probably weren't aware of it. Uh, so, um, but what you didn't do was um, uh, 
uh, spend a lot of time on the current medis medications that are available, S S SSRIs, SNRIs, and the development of those uh, that have progressed from the 1960s onwards. You, you had a slide on, on there, which, which uh, the TCAs, the antipsychotic medications. Uh, it's impossible, it's impossible to do all this in half an hour. You know? No, I, I understand that. And, and I, I knew you, you had to go through, but it was a great talk going into the background of, of the history of uh, psychological treatment. Uh, I think what, what, what needs to be done is with all these new medications that are coming into the market uh, with FDA approvals and EME approvals, uh, most of them are not... Um, effective because they are not provided uh, to the patient uh, on a personalized base. Uh, and tomorrow I'm going to uh, discuss a, a test that, that would help mm -hmm. psychiatrists to personalize those medications, which will then reduce the number of uh, uh, patients that stop taking medications and, uh, uh, because of uh, side effects or because of toxicity or because it's not... Uh, Effic uh, it doesn't show any efficacy. So I think what, what needs to be done is more research needs to be done towards that, towards personalizing the medicine rather than treating every individual the same way and trying out these medications and then titrating the doses later on uh, when, when the patient has already started titrating himself. Well, uh, you're quite right. The problem is that uh, it's very difficult it's very expensive, uh, not difficult, it's very expensive to identify in, in an evidence-based way w in which way you will go and have precision and personalized psychiatry, because this is the future, precision and personalized. But in order to do this, you need to have accumulated a huge amount of data which are rather not available today, at least as evidence. They are available as opinion and as approaches, but not as evidence. And history says that opinion do not matter. Opinion is, all, is usually mistaken. Uh, the, the, best, the best thing we have is, uh, the best tool we have is the pre-registration of trials. This is an excellent tool, and we have it only for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So we know what has been predefined and pre-registered, so we do not have the post hoc bias. Because if I have a trial and I play with variables and see, OK, these 10 variables, the 11th works, then I selectively publish this 11th, 11th effect, which is probably mistaken It's by, by chance. So by this pre-registration, we will arrive at some time, maybe in 20 years, to some kind of personalized uh, medicine. This is why I said that we need a, a complete free access to raw data. We will at least double our knowledge, not by conducting new research, by, but by analyzing in, 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 in a bias-free way data that already exists. Thank you very much for this marvelous, although horrifying, journey through the history of psychiatry. Uh, I guess no one of us was there anyway in this history, but I just want to make a comment um, on the history of the last uh, 30, 30 years. I think uh, just something for the younger uh, colleagues to remember. I think we have lived the revolution from the first generation in psychotic drugs to the second generation and psychotic drugs. And the difference they make to the quality of the life of the psychotic patients. Years ago, any, 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 any patient who was taking first generation antipsychotic was always seen. You could show he's taking antipsychotic, he's taking antipsychotic, he's walking around the square and he's taking antipsychotic. It was very... Uh, very clear that he was taking antipsychotic drugs. And so the stigma was always following him or her. Recent second generation antipsychotics are more safe with less side effects and I think they uh, actually 
provide much more better quality of life for our patients. It's a, more or less, as you said, it's a little bit more complex. It's, it's always a little bit more complex. Uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, the, the way for, for a drug to make it into the market was a very, a very uh, uh, liberal way. Uh, you could produce a drug in, uh, in your uh, laboratory and then go to the nearby asylum and ask the doctors to try this on their patients. Nobody knew that you are, going, you, you are doing a trial. This, uh, the consent and the informed consent and all these are things after the 60s, after 1966, to be precise. So we don't really know how many of these early drugs really work, to be honest. For example, uh, amisulpride has not proper placebo control trials in proper patients with schizophrenia. It has only two trials in negative schizophrenia for negative, um, symptoms. for negative symptoms. This is similar to trials with antidepressants on schizophrenia for negative symptoms, but it's not uh, equivalent to uh, trials of antipsychotics for positive symptoms. You, you can see the difference. So a lot of agents that uh, exist today in the market are not probably properly tested. And sometimes it's, it seems that they are more sedating rather than antipsychotic. And to be completely honest, when we are talking about first generation antipsychotics, we are talking about haloperidol. We are not talking about flufenazine. We are not uh, talking about uh, whatever. We are talking about haloperidol. And in the, in, in the future, when we will uh, talk about second generation, we will talk about two or three or four maximum. Mm -hmm. Not for all that exist today. So yeah. it's... Now, uh, what I was saying is that you, you were going to an asylum and you asked the doctors to try this to their patients by means of goodwill of the doctors and the patients. And at some time, there were uh, side effects and deaths, and especially after the thalidomide case, uh, there was a demand for more rigorous testing of uh, drugs. And then the first idea was that uh, the state should test drugs, but then the demand was so huge that even the American uh, government could not satisfy uh, the economical needs to test so many agents. So the next step was that the industry who develops the drug is responsible for, pro for providing the data. This is why we came to this model, which is uh, very restrictive, very stationary, very difficult, but still it's the only viable. Any other points raised? Dr. Vudulek is always stimulating and sometimes he goes against his own self in terms of pharmacology. So I want to thank you all very much and thank you, Professor, for your selection.